in a very dark and humid dungeon with large stalactites and stalagmites, everything was filled with mystery and the anticipation of another battle. The group of warriors could barely move as their unit had already lost a significant number of fighters. The mages illuminated the passage and they moved forward, step by step, toward their main destination. Exhausted from his wounds, one of the warriors fell again and lost consciousness. One of the team leaders said that if that happened, Hiller wouldn't have enough mana to heal them all. Are they doomed to die here, underground? He was sharply interrupted by his colleague to stop him from talking nonsense. Barely regaining consciousness, the young man smiled, looked at the commander of this group, and said hopefully that they still had a long way to go. He was a real hero, a man with a huge sword, in shiny and expensive armor, who showed complete confidence in his appearance. In a loud voice, he told them that since they had the energy for idle chatter, it wasn't that bad, that they should hold out a little longer. The warriors happily replied that they would try. To himself, this warrior thought this was a bad thing, because his team was beginning to worry. There were seventy-four of them in this raid to begin with, but after many battles with huge monsters, there were only forty-three left. He gritted his teeth in annoyance. But the important thing is not that we lost thirty-one men but that forty-three fighters still have their hearts beating. He comforted himself with this thought. And despite their best efforts, they could not protect thirty-one comrades in this unequal battle with a huge number of flying monsters. But they were ready for it, because they were in one of the seven dungeons of the great evil. It was one of the most important caves in all of humanity. Brightly colored flying orbs of magic illuminated the warrior's path. The young man looked up to survey the vast expanse of the dark dungeon called the Primordial Core. A member of the group approached our commander and told him to pay attention to the gigantic passageway that lay directly in front of them. At last we have reached the end of the Primordial Core, the brave warrior thought to himself. Without a second thought, they stepped forward into this dark and ominous, mysterious room. The end of the adventure, after all the sacrifices— is a place that holds an unimaginable amount of treasure. Maybe even along with thirty-six masterpieces of the greatest works created by mankind. Besides, the boss lives here, so everyone has to be careful. And in the next second, the leader of the group grabbed his sword. He shouted loudly to the rest of the team to line up in battle order and take their positions. The mages had to light the area, visibility was needed. Everyone froze and not a sound was heard. The noise stopped. At this time, the mages created more glowing orbs to increase their range of vision. Everyone must be on their guard. There had never been so much light in this dark room, so they had a good view of everything that was going on here. But in the next second, something amazingly terrifying happened. The huge monster opened its eyes. And they were the eyes of the beast— which glowed brightly from the unusually large amount of light, showing with its entire appearance that it was simply gigantic in size. At what he saw, our knight's eyes widened with fear, and a cold sweat ran down his back. In the next second, he saw countless sharp fangs of this huge monster opening its mouth. No one could even move, everyone stood like a stiff-necked man. Suddenly, someone shouted, Run! He can't be killed! And now we are transported to another place, where a skeleton in armor communicates with his friend like a true psychologist. A bunch of humans came in while you were sleeping, but despite your fatigue, you fought them honorably, he told someone. Did I hear you right? The giant replied. Yes, you did. It was the same monster that had frightened all of our team members, causing them to run away. Compared to this insignificant skeleton— a huge creature lay proudly on the ground with its paws spread apart. This amazing creature said that both humans and his own body were against him. He asked his friend to calm down and take it easy, but he didn't even think about stopping. How could he calm down after such a prank? After all, this creature is the dungeon boss. And when all those people came, he was asleep, but he had to be on his guard, not wait for them to come right at him and all he had the sense to do was just yawn at them. Is this really how it's supposed to be? Skeleton wondered. You lack basic discipline. He began to shout loudly, and his voice was very stern. Discipline, you know? 
Then he turned aside and looked at the girl to get her opinion on the situation. Slowly raising her eyes, she softly said that this creature was able to stun people just by yawning. The girl was once again amazed by the majesty of this huge monster. She came closer, and even from a distance, this skeleton could tell that she was crazy about this creature. She's completely in love with him. Very frustrated, our skeleton sat down on a chair and realized that it was time to get over it. Then, with sadness in his eyes, he declared that this dungeon was over. The huge monster reassured him. He asked him not to worry so much, because the extra nerves could make his health deteriorate. One of the seven dungeons of great evil that humanity has no hope of conquering is the primordial core. Most dungeon raids end with humans winning. The position that monsters should always be ready to block humans who can attack at any moment is completely unfair. In the end, it is the dungeons that become weaker as the war goes on. However, in a world where countless dungeons are being conquered and appearing, it is only natural that there will be an exception that cannot be conquered. A dungeon of immense evil, or rather, seven dungeons of immense evil that are considered beyond the reach of humanity. Of the seven great evil dungeons, the core of antiquity is the most complex demonic one. It is inhabited by dozens of alien creatures that guard the place. And gatekeepers guarding the three crossroads. A homunculus guards the red path on the left. A skeleton guards the blue road in the middle. Exact information about the contaminated road on the right is not yet known. And this whole impregnable fortress is ruled by the primordial monster that appears in the first chapter of the imperial mythos. That's what the book said. The girl covered it with her hand and tied a golden ribbon around it. Just as you said, dear monster, after such books spread among humans, the number of people who wanted to enter the dungeon increased. She was crouching in her beautiful maid's dress holding a book in both hands. To which the monster replied, You need brains to run a dungeon. Being mystical and mysterious is not an option. People won't even try to come here. The giant monster rejoiced like a little child who had just been read an interesting fairy tale. He went on to say that we should tell a little bit of the truth so that people would think, Aha, we know exactly how things work there. So as soon as they saw a little book describing the laws of the dungeon, albeit half-fictional, they rushed to it like moths to a flame. After some thought, he continued, I didn't expect such a crowd, there were quite a few this time. In his memories, he saw the huge pile of defeated warriors again. How many were there? Seventy-four? He asked as if to himself. Yes, but most of their equipment melted when they fought my giant black tentacles, so those warriors were useless. And quality equipment is quite expensive, he concluded. The girl whispered quietly that she could easily kill those warriors with her own blade, and the monster nodded in agreement. Then this huge monster began to whirl around the room and a large ball of energy formed right above the girl's head. In the next second, its hands gradually appeared and it took on a humanoid form. As if coming down from on high, he placed his right hand on the girl's head and gently stroked her, reassuring her that she could take care of herself. She was very pleased to receive such attention from the dungeon boss, and she blushed with embarrassment. But suddenly they were interrupted by a death knight who declared that this was not a conference, and that they should stop having fun. He had no way of knowing why they were still partying as if nothing had happened. He grinned at them and jokingly said that they were such a cute couple that he might soon have cavities. And that not only would his teeth rot, but also his head. Then he asked his boss to change his body properly, and do it normally because he had just caressed the girl's head with his six-fingered hand. The young man stared in surprise at the hand with more fingers. Indeed, there were six of them. Nothing gave him away as a dungeon boss. He was a well-built young man in civilian clothes. Knight continued to compliment him, saying that the boss was making progress. Last time, the sight of forty teeth had given him goosebumps when he smiled brightly and said the transformation had been successful. This annoyed the girl, who told the skeleton that the sound of his chin rattling was too loud. He was taking the boss's attention away from himself. The skeleton thought that he should get rid of his position as dungeon gatekeeper as soon as possible. Afterwards, they had a small meeting and discussed current affairs as if they were sitting in an office. Joyfully, 
The blade-wielding maid reported that finally, finally, people were starting to cross the right-of-way. Of course, everyone knew that. The problem was that Mr. 116 Black Tentacles was badly injured. The wounds looked quite critical. The young man, who had been a monster not long ago, replied that there was no need to worry too much because the regeneration of tentacles was much faster than they thought. He said we'll have to wait a while, and if things don't improve, we'll find a replacement gatekeeper. The skeleton shouted that if he was going to look for a replacement, he should look for two at once. He wants to resign. What are you talking about? You have a contract for life, the young man said in surprise. Anyway, from now on, the people's path would only be the right one, he said confidently. Everyone listened intently to their boss. The skeleton added that people might already be forming new teams. The girl added that these days, people use communication magic like telepathy quite extensively, so the information that there was a chance on the right polluted path might have already spread. The young man slammed his palm down on the table and said that they would have to plan their strategy accordingly and switch positions to better repel the human attacks. And since the girl had previously defended the left red path, from today on she would defend the right path. He continued, People will think that the right way is free, and they will go there. You'll show them. The girl shouted enthusiastically and joyfully that she would defend the dungeon no matter how many humans invaded it. Then he turned to the skeleton and said that the way the maid had protected was now his. Surprised, the skeleton didn't understand why he had to do this now. However, his boss explained that if people found out that it was him standing on the polluted path, they would take the red path that she had originally defended. That's why he's going to meet them there. He seems to have planned everything very well. He clapped his hands and concluded that they could defend themselves against two invasions at once. Skeleton had something to add and interrupted him. And if the people take the middle blue route, what then? The boss didn't seem to have thought of that. There was a pause and everyone fell silent. With a caustic smile, he said quietly that people would then have a chance to have a date with him. The skeleton lowered his head and said quietly that this was a sloppy strategy. However, the girl did not share his words and was pleased with her boss's strategy. She continued to lead the meeting. Now that they had dealt with the more pressing matters, the only thing left to decide was what to do with the sword. The young man, already quite tired, asked her again what sword she was talking about. It seems that the guys who broke into their dungeon last time were quite strong, since they carried such a sword. Everyone was curious to know what kind of sword it was. Here it is, the skeleton said cheerfully, holding the hilt of this huge sword with his bony hand. It is one of the thirty-six masterpieces. It is very popular among people. It was a perfectly formed blade, very sharp. And the steel shone very brightly in the light, reflecting the dazzling light. There are also masterpieces that are not weapons. All in all, this sword seems to be the fourteenth sword among them. And it's called something like Tanabello. The skeleton finished his story. Leaning back in his chair, the young man scratched his head and remembered that he had heard about something similar before. I believe there were similar swords in the dungeon. He added that this girl's blade was also one of the thirty-six masterpieces. She was holding this beautiful horseshoe-shaped knife in her hand. Then the boss added that he thought people were starting to walk around with pretty good weapons. What will they do now? The knight figured that if they gave this sword to the fighters at the entrance, the men could overpower the guards and take the sword for themselves. And then they'll be in trouble. So it's probably best to leave it here in this place. The young man then asked the skeleton if he was wielding a sword. Maybe he wants to take it for himself. He said that since the boss insisted, he would take the sword for himself. Even though it was all he'd been waiting for. This is the dungeon. This is the primordial core. It's the home of a terrifying blade-wielding homunculus maiden. A death knight who exudes the energy of destruction. And a giant ancient monster. The young man was barely on his feet. So he lay down on the table, showing that he was already tired of this meeting. He added that since the skeleton had gotten the sword, he could tear up the letter of resignation. Because he hid it between his ribs, and the boss knows it. It was a great team. A trio of interesting characters. 
a determined made with a blade. The sole conscience of the dungeon in the form of a doom-bringing skeleton. A master of criticizing the boss. And the epitome of laziness, an ancient monster. And so they have all been fighting the incessant streams of warriors for years. Once again, our lovely trio gathered for another meeting. Boss, how are we going to distribute the remaining income? The girl asked the young man. While the skeleton didn't seem interested in their conversation, he was pleased with his new sword. Like the director of a large corporation, the boss replied, We will do as usual, take what we can and use the useless things as bait for the next group. Happy and smiling, the girl replied that she was satisfied with this arrangement and that she would take care of the details. The boss nodded. The girl added that monsters can't use magic weapons. Maybe it's time to take off the magic stones and sell them. You could make a lot of money, she added. Surprised, the young man asked her again if it was true and they could make a lot of money. There was a pause, then he added. Maybe I should go to town for the first time in a long time. In the next second, the two were alarmed beyond belief. They looked at him with wide eyes. The skeleton has no eyes, of course. A little startled by their reaction, he asked them why they were so surprised. They didn't seem to want to send their boss to the village at all. Skeleton suggested that the maid go. The young man asked again why they didn't want to send him alone. The skeleton replied that he was not good at transforming into a human. There's still a tail sticking out. In the next second, it was clear to everyone without words that a girl was going to the city. Okay, the boss added, the important thing is to grab a lot of goodies on the way. And in a moment, she was walking through the woods towards the village. She was wearing a dress, and nothing gave away her mysterious appearance, only a dark cloak that covered her entire head. The weather is not bad today, she noticed. Farewell, she turned toward the cave and said she would be back soon. After some time, the girl reached the village, where she went into the shop of an experienced jeweler, who carefully examined all the stones she had brought with her with a magnifying glass. I'm afraid we can't buy one of those, he told her. She stood there a little confused and didn't know what to say. Why can't you buy these stones? She asked him briefly. Her eyes glowed with a bright green light. The jeweler replied that he needed some time and went under the table. He pulled out a beautiful-looking blue stone and placed it in front of her. Here, look, it's a B-grade stone. We commoners have to work hard for ten years to buy it. After that, he continued to explain. The stones you brought are much more valuable, you know. Such stones can only be used by imperial palace mages or high-level mages. Next to the stone he had just placed in front of her was a huge, beautiful-looking ruby, emerald, and the rest of the gems. The jeweler thought for a while, then added that such a stone might be bought by a jeweler in the capital who had an agreement with the imperial family, or the wizard's tower might be interested in such a stone. The capital and the wizard's tower, I see, the girl said. She thought that the capital was too far away for her, she would have to visit the tower. But it seemed that she didn't really want to go there, so she tied her bag with one hand. Nevertheless, she decided to do it for her boss. She said goodbye to the jeweler, who wished her to be more careful. As she was leaving, he called out to her that she had forgotten one of her jewels. She's obviously got a good jeweler. She turned in his direction and said quietly that it was his tip, then thanked him again and thanked him for the information. She called him a man. What a queer girl, the jeweler pronounced. She's human too, isn't she? After a while, the girl reached the mage tower. It was a stately building, reflecting the taste, style, and wealth of its owner. She was met at the entrance by guards who advised her to see the guild leader if she wanted to sell her stones. She replied well and went forward. I will escort you to the office of our leader. Please follow me, one of the guards told her. With the lantern in his hand, he began to climb the long stone staircase to the top. The girl thought that at the top was the office of the head of the wizard's tower and the shape of the building was no accident. This building resembled a dungeon in its structure. After a while, they reached the top and the girl approached the office of the guild leader. A beautiful young girl surrounded by her bodyguards greeted the girl and said with a smile that she was happy to see her. 
she introduced herself as the head of the Wizard's Tower Guild and was pleased by her presence. Behind her back was a large magic crystal. The head mage of the tower stood up and asked the girl who she was. The girl thought that this person had a lot of mana. Afterwards, the woman in the feathered hat added that when she was told that the tower was expecting a child, she thought she wouldn't even do it. But the guard told her that she had brought her a large number of mana stones. She asked her if she had heard anything about her tower. She really hoped that the stones she had brought were of high quality, up to the highest standards of her tower. Her eyes never stopped shining with a pleasant pink light. And in the next second, the girl suggested that she check the quality of the stones herself. She opened her bag and began to pour out a huge amount of beautiful gems onto the table. The guild leader froze in astonishment and couldn't say a word. She had never seen such a huge amount of gemstones before. These are A-grade stones. She thought enthusiastically. Afterwards, she picked up a few stones to examine them more closely. Some of them were of the highest quality. How could this little girl have so many treasures? She kept wondering in her head. Who is she really? The sorceress thought to herself. Then she asked the child a question. Where are you from, my dear? The girl remained silent for a while, but then the sorceress turned her attention to her hair. Among the eight great families of the empire, there was one with hereditary silver hair. It turned out that the daughter of this family ran away from home and took the stones with her. There was no way she could explain to herself that the girl had brought such a large amount of mana stones with her. Anyway, she's a noble lady, she can't know how much they cost. She continued her mental analysis. The mage then interrupted the pause in the air and said she apologized for her earlier rudeness. She had not expected the stones to be in such good condition. She explained that her guild would like to buy them all. She then offered fifty ounces of gold for each and they will offer a special price of eighty ounces of gold for the highest quality stones. All the while, her guests remained mysteriously silent, listening intently to this head sorceress. Meanwhile, one of the guards brought them two cups of hot tea. After a pause, the girl asked her if she was sure she wanted to give her fifty ounces of gold, remembering the words of the jeweler in the village shop who had told her that commoners had to work hard for ten years to buy one of her stones. Typically, a person earns ten ounces of gold in one year. Ten years is one hundred ounces. Of course, this girl realized that she was being tricked, so she raised her eyes and looked at the sorceress with big green lights and declared, Man, if you cheat me, you're gonna die. The sorceress froze and did not know what to say to her. She thought to herself that her trick had failed, and it seemed that this girl clearly knew what she was doing. Then she added, to be honest, our guild doesn't have enough money to buy them all. Then buy as many as you can, the girl replied sternly. After saying these words, the guild leader smiled. She opened a huge chest containing a large amount of gold coins. Two thousand ounces of gold is all we have, she said. The guild leader then offered her a new deal. She would like to exchange the remaining stones for something very valuable. The girl asked her if she was sure of the value of the goods since they should be easy to sell. To which she received the affirmative answer that you don't have to worry about it. After that, the guild master pointed with her hand as if to offer her a way out, and told the girl to follow her. She will show her these precious items. The owner of this building added that the rules did not allow outsiders in here, but as an exception, she agreed to let her guest in. After a while, they were in the spacious room that was the storeroom of this tower and she began to show her jewelry, which was of great value. It was a four-carat diamond tiara with magic stones set in the center. Mages could certainly use one of these. Here's a special ring with living black pearls. If there is poison near the wearer of this ring, it will make a howling sound. These pearls were made by alchemy. The girl looked at the box containing the ring, but it was clear from her emotions that she didn't like everything she saw. Turning the conversation into a joke, the sorceress laughed and asked, Didn't you enjoy it? After all, alchemy is an unhygienic science. She explained, Of course I can understand your disgust. She then suggested that she turn her attention to a new topic. What will she say this time? It was a huge red heart-shaped crystal, 
reflecting the light brightly and glittering in the dim glow of the lamps. The red stone of love, she added. This diamond is said to make love come true. Having said that, she turned her head towards the girl with a smile, as if waiting for her reaction. The sorceress seemed to have found an approach, for the diamond that embodied love really interested the girl. She knew who she could use it on. In the next second, her eyes burned with a great desire to possess this object. Observing her reaction, the sorceress added that if she infused mana into this gem in front of someone she liked, the spirit residing in this precious crystal would establish eternal love between the two people. The girl interjected. Between the two of them, really? Yes, I give my word as the head of the Tower Guild. The sorceress replied quickly and sternly. Did you like it? She asked the girl as if expecting some kind of reaction, realizing that she really needed such a diamond. Impatiently, the girl exclaimed, Yes, I would like to take the diamond for myself. And as if continuing her subtle game, the experienced sorceress added that this gem could cause them a lot of trouble anyway. It can drown the emperor in the depths of worship and love. Therefore, she thinks it would be difficult to set a price for such a thing. It is a very expensive and valuable item. For a second, the girl was stunned, unable to find the right words, but in the next second, it showed her something this sorceress had never seen before. Her eyes were wide open and she couldn't believe that this little girl could have such an item. The child then added that with all the money she had received and the item she held in her hands, she would like to have the diamond for herself. She offered her rare weapon as ransom for a heart-shaped stone. After a while, when the girl left, one of their alchemists approached the guild leader. Surprised, he asked her if she had really given the diamond to the girl. The guild master replied, And what's the big deal? Yes, I did. Ignoring the questions from outside, she continued to look at the newly acquired stones and whistled a song. She was enjoying a job well done. The young man with a very worried face kept saying that she should realize what could happen to this girl. It's very easy to drive this girl to her death. So what? The guild leader replied briefly looking at the precious object of interest through the magnifying glass once again. She didn't care about the fate of this little girl. The petty noblewoman wanted the diamond herself, she added succinctly. The young man continued to worry and said that she still shouldn't have done it. At that moment, the woman turned to him and told him to stop worrying, because she would die anyway once what was encased in the stone was released. The unfortunate girl's favorite person will also die so there would be no evidence left. Making her way through a dense part of the forest, the little girl held on tightly to the bag that contained her most precious possession for the moment. Of course, a little pity for her beloved, added the guild leader of this tower. After a while, the girl reached a huge castle, an impregnable fortress perched high on a mountain. It was a gloomy building, and its appearance indicated that it was probably uninhabited. In a moment, the little girl was sitting in the hairdresser's chair of this castle. It was a woman with long, sharp, red light nails, large scissors, and a mysterious image. She methodically continued to mow the girl down. It turns out that this is not the first time Our Lady has come to this woman for a haircut. She asked her to apologize for showing up so suddenly and bothering her with her visit. The woman replied that there was no need to worry and proceeded to cut her hair carefully. After all, they were neighbors and should help each other, she added with a smile. And how could she refuse to see her beautiful friend? It was the dungeon master of his castle. As she continued to smile, she didn't hide her sympathy for the girl and said that she sometimes envied her because the girl was a homunculus. After all, her beautiful face will never age and she will always be young. The girl responded that she also looked very young and that her skin was much clearer and lighter than hers. But it turned out that the mistress of this castle was a vampire who used a lot of blood to maintain her splendor and beyond. Her guests wondered how she looked now, as if she was a little unsure of herself. According to this master of the castle, her friend looked stunning. She was the most beautiful she'd seen in a long time. She assured her that with her looks and new hairstyle, no one would dare turn her down. Our little maid blushed with embarrassment at such compliments. The vampire then asked her who she was dressing up for. Perhaps she was confessing her love to someone. 
The little person took out her beautiful heart-shaped crystal from her bag and said that she wanted to confess her great love to someone big. To the surprise of the lady of the castle, she said she was only joking and didn't believe the girl's words, but to whom did she want to confess her love? In the next second, the girl's eyes sparkled with thoughts of her lover, while the vampire looked at her somewhat discouraged and surprised. She didn't believe her own words. Was she really going to confess her love to this monster? Maybe this girl was just joking, she has a very good sense of humor, the woman added. Maybe it's because you're a homunculus, she asked her. A little irritated, the girl replied that she was not joking and that she would confess her feelings to this monster today. Like any good friend, she said that there was nothing to hold on to and that she didn't understand what she could possibly like about this monster. The young girl, completely ignoring her words, noted that her lover is nothing but the best because he has many good qualities. For example, he's very reliable. I guess I could agree with that. He's really good at it, the vampire added in a lowered voice. But at the same time, he's incredibly lazy. This monster is always sleeping. And as if she wanted to add positive qualities to her lover, the girl added that he is really big and lazy, eats a lot, sleeps and snores all the time, and often rubs his belly button, which has become very big lately. The older and more experienced vampire added that even though this girl knows everything, her heart is still drawn to this monster. Yes, yes, I like him very much, the girl quickly added. The vampire came quite close to her, and put her hand on her shoulder in a friendly way. She wished her luck, but still felt that this young person deserved so much more. Anyway, if he rejects her, she'll always be there to comfort her. She winked at her, and it was an understandable hidden subtext. The beautiful maid thanked her friend and continued to hold the beautiful stone to her chest. She kept it close to her heart, and never stopped thinking of her lover. And we are transported to the capital of the empire a huge city with a big powerful castle, where very strong warriors and rulers live. A large and spacious room with a domed roof housed the joint command center of the dungeon raids. One of the men announced to everyone gathered that according to their intelligence, the hero's team that had gone to this dungeon earlier had been completely annihilated. The people sitting around the table listened intently to his report. Then, one of them loudly thumped his palm on the table in anger and shouted, what does that mean? Didn't he say that they would easily defeat the gatekeeper? The others present at the meeting could not believe his words either. How could he be so sure of such a terrible outcome when the bodies had not yet been found? Another person began to loudly pound his fist on the table, claiming that the group leader couldn't have been killed by some monsters. Ignoring their emotions, the young man continued his report, convincing them that they did not understand how this dungeon worked. It's not as big and confusing as they think. This particular dungeon is one that either takes a day or doesn't come back at all. And since they haven't heard anything for the second twenty-four hours, things must be pretty bad. And most likely the group leader and the rest of the team are already dead. Only one of them seemed to believe his words. He said that maybe that was the case. But what about the sword the leader was carrying? Where had it gone? The young warrior replied that communication had been lost after the party had infiltrated the core of the ancient world. He believes that until they return to that dungeon and retrieve this fourteenth masterpiece, the sword can be considered lost forever. The man sitting across the table briefly replied that he understood. Those present were clearly not happy with what they had heard, and new emotions of incessant arguing began to ring loudly in the spacious room. How come we have to get him back soon? including the sword. There was no way that this group of warriors could not pass through the core of the primordial core. They felt that the number of casualties should not be increased and that it would be better to abandon the venture altogether. Opinions were divided. Some said they couldn't give up so easily. And if that warrior was fighting the boss, it's likely that the boss was seriously injured as well. Indeed, their warrior was a true hero. To which one of the men added that while they were talking, the dungeon boss was regenerating, and everything else in the dungeon was regenerating as well, so we need to get this over with quickly before their business gets really bad. A cold sweat broke over the man as he realized the full horror of what was happening. He held his head in his hands and thought that the imperial family had already lost their favorite hero, 
and one of the thirty-six masterpieces. If the second dungeon raid failed as well, they would definitely all die. If they left things as they were, they would make the imperial family very angry and pay for it. But there was another possibility. What if this warrior couldn't inflict a single wound on the boss? What then? It didn't matter how many groups they would send on the next raid. After that, the man stood up and declared to everyone present that the primordial core dungeon was impossible to conquer. In the next second, all the men present were very confused after hearing these words. There was a pause, and they did not hide their worried faces. At that time, a young man approached them and asked, What makes you think that? He said that it was quite possible, and that they had a chance to win this dungeon. With some irritation, the head of the committee turned to the young man and asked him what the Imperial Magic Association was doing here, what they had to do with everything that was going on. To which the young man replied with a grin that he needed to know who they were getting all their business from. They were members of the Imperial Magic community called the Third Eye. The next second, the head of the committee started to sweat even more and thought that since they were here, the emperor had already started to interfere with everything that was going on. The young mage told the men that their presence meant that it was time for them to pay for their sins and mistakes. Without hiding his irritation, he said with a malicious look that they were very foolish to lose a precious hero, so much so that they left a masterpiece in the center of the dungeon. The men bowed their heads, unable to find the right words to reply. Then the young mage approached one of them. He put his hand on the man's shoulder and said that even though they had all messed up pretty badly, if they were all noble, who would lead the rest of the raids? He told them that the mages had offered his majesty a solution that could save their wretched souls. Then he loudly and joyfully announced that he had to go through the primordial core once more and descend into that cave. The head of the committee disagreed. How could they do it when even this mighty warrior couldn't? The young mage then spread his arms out to the side and loudly called out the name Nifrim. He told them that Nifrim would go with them. Nobody could believe his words. In fact, he said it right away. The man with the big mustache stammered his words and asked him how on earth they could send Nifrim when the last time had ended in failure, and he had too many problems. The young mage explained that Nifrim was not a failure, but a definite success. Then he leaned heavily on his right hand on the table and moved as close as possible to the committee leader. He looked the old man in the face and asked him a single question. Why was this protagonist and his party unable to escape from the dungeon? Could it be that they are very weak, or is it because they let their guard down? The next second, he was already sitting on the table talking to himself. No, it seems that all of these theories are untenable. What then? Why couldn't they? It seems that this warrior and his group had some kind of problem. A single big problem. The young man obviously knew what he was talking about and had a prepared answer. Because this warrior lacked what Nifrim had. Therefore, this raid will be successful. We return to the dungeon, where the boss sneezes loudly and for a moment his head loses its humanoid form. It seems that he wasn't without telepathic abilities either. He had a bad feeling. It's like something bad is coming. He kept sneezing and was thrown into the air from time to time. Maybe there's some kind of infection going around, he said to himself. In his usual lazy manner, the young monster continued to lie on the floor of his dungeon, unable to get up and do anything. He needed to start patrolling, but he was afraid that the skeleton would tell him off. This evil skeleton knight inspires fear, even though he is nothing but bones. Bones inspire fear. His words made the young man laugh. However, he decided that he would have no problem with the skeleton warrior, and after a quick jump, he was already on his feet. The last time, the humans had entered through a contaminated path. He decided to start with it. After a moment, he approached one of the guards of this dungeon, who spread his huge tentacles all around his large room. The young man examined him closely and noticed several wounds from the fights. Unfortunately, there was nothing he could do to help him only to wait for the creature to regenerate. After that, he continued to explore the rest of his domain. He entered the fifth room of the dungeon, where a huge thorn-bush-shaped monster with large thorns was spreading its leaves. With a quick jump, 
he climbed to the top of a huge tangle of intertwined branches to check on his monster's condition. The monster will continue to regenerate as long as it has a main body and nutrients. Yes, he checked to make sure it was okay. You can stay out of it and continue your patrol. He took a sharp leap forward from a great height and immediately landed on the ground, thinking that he had a problem. The reason was that rooms one to four were in ruins. It seemed worth discussing with the skeleton warrior, but the young man thought he would be told off again. In his usual manner, the next moment he yawned with boredom and thought it was time to rest and deal with everything else later. In his thoughts he praised himself for only looking at the contaminated path through which those disgusting humans had snuck in last time, well, and of course room five. That's enough for today, we can get some sleep. But no sooner had he turned away and fled happily to his common room than a sound came from behind him. In the next second, a huge sword slammed into the stone wall, slicing it in half. This caused a reaction in his body, and he almost started to turn into a huge monster. Perhaps it was the filthy humans who had trespassed again. Well, if they decided to desecrate his dungeon with their presence, they would die here. But the next moment— he was surprised to see that they were not humans at all, but someone very familiar to him. As if on purpose, the young girl had created this situation in order to see her boss. She apologized to him and told him that it seemed to her that some people were intruding and she wanted to deal with them. But it turned out to be her favorite boss, so she apologized to him again. To which the young man replied that there was no need to apologize so much, he was just a little scared. He immediately noticed her beautiful appearance and new look. He froze in surprise, for she was very beautiful. She had dressed up so beautifully, but for whom, he asked her. The young girl was very happy because she was noticed and paid attention to her appearance. Of course, who doesn't love compliments? He asked her if there was a big event coming up. After that, he was already worried that she might quit since she took off her maid's uniform and for sure she wanted to do it before the skeleton warrior. The girl twirled the hair on her finger and said that there was indeed a very important event coming up. She said it in a low voice. But the young man seemed even more worried, and a cold sweat ran down his face. She asked him if he would give her some of his time. A single thought had passed through his mind countless times. Not the firing, not the firing. And after a moment she led him into her secret room into the passage she had recently cut through, showing him that the place was now known to him as well. She invited him to sit down at the table, for she was going to make tea for them. As he slowly approached this festive table, the young man did not stop to think that perhaps the reason for this change in her behavior and appearance was a desire to quit. As usual, they chatted for a while over a cup of tea, laughing and smiling about various things. But then the girl decided to come to the point and a red blush lit up her face. As he continued to drink his tea, the young man listened as she thanked him for taking her into his dungeon, and it had been eighty years since then. Does he remember that? Did he remember that day? Looking at his reflection in his cup of tea, he told her. Sure. He stammered his words a little, still worried about where she was taking the conversation. Eighty years ago, dungeon raids were in vogue, and over a thousand of them were destroyed. The number of people who had penetrated the primordial core exceeded several thousand. And since then, this girl has had her own nickname, because she was a treacherous, terrifying monster who ruined hundreds and hundreds of lives of brave warriors. Yes, 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 of course I remember, said the young man. You did a very good job back then. By the way, how's your right eye? His cold sweat hadn't stopped. Looks like she won't be talking about stopping this time he thought. The girl liked to talk about herself in the third person, so she told her boss that she was very happy that he remembered such an important day in her life. With an important look on his face, he leaned back in his chair, folded his arms across his chest, and said that he certainly remembered everything. And the girl replied that she was always there for him and was happy to help him. It's mutual, the young man replied succinctly but he immediately stopped and realized that perhaps her words meant something. Why did she say she was happy? Words like that are said before saying goodbye, aren't they? He looked at her, and she came closer. 
Was she really going to tell him now that she was going to leave him? All he was thinking about now was her possible dismissal. The next second she looked at him with her big green eyes and told him how she felt and that she liked him. It was clear from his face that he hadn't expected to hear such words. He just froze and didn't know what to do. Finally, after eighty years, all this time she had kept her feelings inside and now she had spoken to him, and she was relieved. She was happy to let him know that she liked him and loved him. After he came to his senses a little and scratched the back of his head, he said he thanked her for her feelings. But they are always at the crossroads of life and death and don't know when they might get hurt, don't know when they might die. She doesn't want either of them to spend the rest of their lives alone, does she? The girl clutched her dress and told him she knew this was how it would end. She knew she was asking the impossible. Still, she wouldn't be able to hide her feelings until the end of time. But when he turns his back on her and her confession means nothing to him, she'll do something interesting. And in the next second, her left hand is already reaching into her back to pull out something interesting. She can't survive if he rejects her. She held a large heart-shaped crystal in her left hand. She told him she would get his love any way she could. Yes, yes, that's right, by any means necessary. Suddenly, she made a sudden movement and came as close to him as she could. Of course, he was very scared. And in that second, her reaction was just the opposite. She was screaming, angry, and said that she would use any means, even the most insidious ones. All he had to do was wait, and she'd have his love. She held out the crystal to him and immediately told him that this was her chance to get it. The young man's eyes widened in horror. He realized that he had a difficult task ahead of him. And if you put mana in here, something terrible will happen. Literally in the next second, the teacup fell to the floor and huge swirls of dark energy began to spin around the room, scattering everything in their path. The young man could barely find his words and said that she was probably going to kill him now. A cold sweat broke out on the girl. She stood there, dazed with fear, not realizing what was happening. Is she really going to kill him? He asked her in a horrible, demonic voice that echoed loudly throughout the spacious room. He began to transform back into a huge, terrifying monster. The young girl was thrown aside in horror and dropped the crystal from her hands, which fell to the ground and shattered into small pieces. As she looked down, she saw that this once beautiful crystal contained an evil spirit of immense power. The skeleton was overjoyed at what had happened. The exhausted dungeon boss lay on the floor as the skeleton warrior ran around him. He was incredibly happy that his master had thrown the young girl out in a fit of rage. The monster wanted to ask him for advice, but the skeleton replied that he had created the problem and now he would have to solve it himself. In the next second, the skeleton hand crushed the remnants of the stone and said that it wasn't just the boss's fault for everything that happened. The skeleton slightly rebuked its master because he was also offended. However, the giant monster said that he didn't remember anything. What he heard made the skeleton angry, and he offered to remind him of everything that had happened. At the moment of danger, when the demon locked in the stone came out, the skeleton ran to his friend to comfort him. He repeated this over and over again to calm the boss down. However, the young man could no longer hear anything and gradually turned into a giant monster with four eyes. While the skeleton was trying to talk to the boss, the girl was sobbing on the stone, and her tears were falling on the rocky ground. The skeleton shouted at her to drop the stone and save herself, and he would take care of the rest. But he realized that she couldn't hear him now either, so the next second he drew his huge sword and struck her with great force, sending her flying to the other end of the room. Thus, he saved her from imminent doom and could now help his boss. By this time, the giant creature had already taken its final form and was talking to the skeleton. It seemed to want to kill him now, too, but the skeleton just slapped its palm on his skull. It appears that his boss now remembered everything and was ashamed. And while the monster burned with shame, the skeleton pondered why things happened the way they did. Frustrated, the boss realized that the girl was gone, and now she had to be brought back. The skeleton explained that they really needed her, and they couldn't do it without her, because she did everything in this dungeon cooking, 
restocking monsters, resetting traps, as well as giving advice and handling complaints. She also did all the accounting in gold. They realized that they couldn't live in this dungeon without her. After that, the skeleton suggested that the boss find the girl by all means. Even if he had to get down on his knees and cry, the boss had to find the lost maiden. He changed back into a young man. The skeleton suggested that he take a magical item with him. It was a special demura that helped to maintain mana balance. It was an expensive item that even this boss had never seen before. And as long as the young man had six fingers on his hand again, this item would help him transform better so that he wouldn't give himself away in the company of humans. The dungeon master couldn't understand where the skeleton had gotten such a thing, as if he had prepared it beforehand. The dungeon boss liked the new item very much, and the skeleton asked to use it for its intended purpose. He said goodbye to the skeleton and started to depart, leaving the dungeon to him. As he left, the skeleton told him to return within five days because the human attack was imminent. The boss had to get back before the humans attacked, because if they took their place of power, the dungeon would be doomed. He has five days at most. The young man promised to return with the girl. The skeleton shouted at him that when the boss went to town, he should act normal so that people wouldn't recognize him as a monster. Turning around, the young man replied that if things didn't go according to plan, he would simply destroy everyone. Realizing that things were much more complicated than they seemed at first, Skeleton began to read the latest news in the newspaper. He learned that the girl had left her weapon behind earlier and received a demonic stone in return. Her prank almost got her killed by her boss. The skeleton has an idea how she got the stone. If the boss finds out, he will wipe out every human on the planet. Now is not the time for such big battles, the skeleton thought and started to read the newspaper. The next second, he was shocked by the news that the Dungeon Raid Joint Command Center would be passing the dungeon within three days. A complete nightmare and fear gripped him because he had recently told his boss that he had five days, but there was no way they would fit in three days. We are transported to the surface of Solar Earth, where the boss lies in a huge crater. Dust clouds were still in the air, and boss realized that he had landed in the wrong place for the second time. He remembered the skeleton's words, telling him that mana was unstable and that it was best not to use magic. He observed the lack of balance, but decided to try again. And in the next second, he gave the command to teleport himself to the town where the girl had sold the stones earlier. We are transported to a dungeon where a brave group of warriors have reached the demon queen. Sitting on her golden throne, she promised them a glorious death. The warrior told her that they were an elite group, so she shouldn't be so cocky. They will dethrone her and make themselves famous across the continent. His words made the demon queen laugh, and she rose from her throne to prepare for battle. The next second, she had already cast her first spell and flew towards the warriors. They should be proud that they recognized her name, and now they will die. However, the leader of the group was not going to give up so easily and rushed to attack. But no matter how hard he tried, he failed. At that time, the mage decided to help the group leader and entered the battle. The queen shouted that they were about to be burned alive and cast another magical power on them. Huge beams of energy began to destroy all living things around them. Before the leader of the group could think about it, a huge rock flew towards him in the next second. He barely had time to raise his sword as a shield. But in the next second, the queen managed to prepare a new spell and huge ice flows flew towards him. The warrior was able to dodge and in the next moment launched another attack. He accelerated and threw a piece of a huge stone slab in her direction. The queen easily parried his attack and prepared to finish off the insolent man. However, her ice spears ran into a huge shield of magic. To her surprise, she found that the mage was still alive and helping his leader. She had already swung around for another attack and came quite close to the warrior. In an instant, her hand and his sword made contact, but in the next second, there was a huge crack in the ceiling and rocks flew down. Something hit the ground with great force, knocking the group leader and the demon queen to the side. Neither of them understood what had happened or who or what had appeared. As soon as the group leader got up, 
he said that he couldn't believe that someone could have come and helped him. The demon queen thought that help had come that had the power to destroy her castle. But who was it really? And once the smoke cleared and the dust settled, our main character appeared. It seems that he had the wrong address again and wanted to ask them where the city he wanted was. No one could understand who he was or what he was doing here. Two enemies from the past united in their anger against an uninvited guest. The warriors advised him to stay away from the demon queen since he was human. He looked at the girl and couldn't believe that she was a demon queen. He remembered that her ancestors looked very different. Maybe it was a matter of changing generations. The queen began to threaten again that she would destroy everyone. Meanwhile, support in the form of new warriors had already approached the leader of the group. All were ready to attack the demon queen, but the young man stopped them with his hand. He tried to ask them where the city he needed was, but no one seemed to hear him and everyone was busy fighting. Clouds of smoke and dust swirled around our hero as he sat pitifully on the ground, unsure of what to do next. He seemed to be getting really fed up and frustrated. He needed to find the girl quickly, but he realized that there was no way he could make a deal with all these people. The warriors got quite close to our hero and began to harass him. And the next second, he told them to shut up, and then he started to turn into a giant monster. Terror and fear gripped these people, and they crawled across the ground, running for their lives. Each of them was destined to die for there was no escape from his power. Stumbling and falling, they died instantly. After a while, he turned back into a calm, friendly young man. Much to the surprise of the queen, who had round eyes at what she saw. The demon queen held her wand in embarrassment, and realized that this man was very strong. In terms of mana reserves, he surpassed her strength. She seemed to be falling in love with him, and wanted to know more about him. She had many questions. She began to whirl and run around him, asking him many questions. While the young man stood silently in one place. It was clear from his expression that he was in no mood for conversation. The demon queen remembered that she had forgotten to introduce herself. With great pomp, she called out her full name and introduced herself to our hero. But what's our hero's name? She couldn't help but wonder. However, the young man was disgusted by her behavior and felt uncomfortable looking at her. He almost said his name, but immediately remembered the words of the skeleton who had advised him to be careful not to tell anyone his real name. He gave the demon queen his fake name and said he was looking for his friend. Even though he made up a name that wasn't quite right, the demon queen paid no attention and was pleased. She wanted to thank him for his help in the battle, even though he had blown up half the castle. The young man covered his face with his hand. If it weren't for him, she would definitely get hurt, even though he didn't want to help. And since he saved her, she's now indebted to him and willing to help him. Our hero gladly accepted her offer and asked her to help him find the town he was looking for. He thought she knew the name of the city, but the next second he could see in her eyes that she was crazy about him. Now he realized that not only did she not know the way to the town itself, but she did not even know the name of such a place. He asked her where the nearest town was, since he'd flown far enough. The girl told him the name of the nearest city, and the young man was horrified because it was a very distant realm. Our hero realized that an ordinary man would have to travel on horseback for two months to reach a city where the girl might be. He became very upset and lay down on the ground to the great surprise of the demon queen but his new girlfriend suggested that he use a special teleportation center. He seemed to have never heard of it. She explained that it was a man-made invention created by magic and alchemy. This magic device forcibly creates magic to move through space. Now he was curious to know where this center was located. She replied that it was in the capital of the empire. After a while, our heroes reached the center of the city much to the demon queen's delight. The young man was worried that he would not be able to find his friend here, but it was worth it to find out more about the place first. The demon queen enthusiastically offered her help and said that she would like to find the silver-haired girl together with him. Our hero wondered how she could leave her castle unattended. After all, she is his mistress. She was very pleased that he cared about her. 
she assured him that he could rest easy. After all, she is a demon queen and a creature born to rule, so the shape of the dungeon is irrelevant to her. Wherever she goes, wherever she is, the place becomes a haven for monsters. And those monsters are her army. The young man marveled at her ability to summon her warriors at any time. The girl exclaimed happily and replied that it was true. Though she had never tried it herself, her father had once been able to do similar things. Maybe it'll work for her now. With sadness in her voice, she informed him that unfortunately the castle her father had built had been destroyed, so there was no point in going back there. She told him that they were constantly visited by people who were stationed very close to the castle. It's really hard when the capital of the human empire is right in front of the castle. After that, she was happy again, and as if she was in a familiar place, she suggested to her friend that she go and get the information they needed. And after a while, they found themselves in a completely unexpected place for our hero. It was a large beer hall in the center of town, where men usually gathered in the evenings. The young man wondered to his friend what they were doing here, why they were spending so much time in this place. He didn't realize that this bar could provide them with useful information. For a while, it seemed as if the girl wasn't listening to what he was saying and continued to drink glass after glass. Then she informed him that he was completely ignorant of how people work, because there is a huge accumulation of information in a bar like this. All you have to do is look around and listen and you can hear all these conversations. She reported that it is just a treasure trove of information. You just have to filter out what's important. The young man didn't understand how any conversations could be filtered out in such a din. His gaze turned to the blackboard where various announcements were posted. The girl exclaimed excitedly that this was the place she was looking for, where she could find announcements for dungeon raids. These were lists of teams participating in raids. This was done to prevent multiple groups from raiding the same dungeon. The young man thought this made sense since there had never been multiple groups raiding at the same time. The girl explained to him that it would cause problems with the reward system, so no one did it. Of course, if several groups came together at the same time, they would have a better chance, but people get greedy, so this is what happens. The young man casually said that we are better off in this situation. The girl turned to him and asked is he a dungeon monster too. A cold sweat ran down the young man's back. After such a question, she looked at him in surprise and couldn't understand it. After all, dungeon monsters couldn't just walk freely on the street like that. Okay, she, the mistress of the castle, could do such a thing, but him. The young man suggested that she just forget what he said, and the girl agreed, because he really has a lot of secrets, and she will not bother him with her questions anymore. Maybe he has his own reasons for withholding such information. The next second... Our hero was drawn to a certain advertisement placed right in the middle of the board. It said that this was his home, i.e. his dungeon, and thankfully the group list was still empty, which meant that he still had some time. His friend was hovering near our hero, unable to see anything due to the young man's large stature. She also wanted to see the information he had just found. He took the sheet from the board and showed it to her. Her eyes widened in amazement. She exclaimed loudly that this was one of the seven dungeons of the great evil. She raves and admires this dungeon, for it is her favorite. For the power of this dungeon was recognized even by the people. The girl held the piece of paper in her hands as if it were something special. Maybe it was because it was the strongest of the seven dungeons. After that, she began to talk about this dungeon in very enthusiastic terms, and our hero stood there listening. In his mind, he was a bit at odds with her. He would say that he was just an ordinary host, not a ruler who suffered from the evil inhabitants of his dungeon. After that, the girl said that she would like to become stronger, and maybe by improving her abilities, she would be able to see the huge monster that lives there. Our hero looked at her with a stone face and realized that she was looking at him. That monster. As she drank another glass of beer, she thought that being the most powerful was a wonderful thing and she wanted to be just that. Then she remembered her father, who was also very strong, a worthy demon king, not like her. However, there were men who were stronger than her father, and one such warrior was Byrne, a rather young hero. 
The young man pretended that he didn't understand anything and didn't want to meet this hero at all. However, some time ago, when he yawned after a nap, he just swallowed him. The girl told him about her dream that she had been thinking about for a long time. She didn't want to run a dungeon for the rest of her life. She just wanted monsters, attracted by her power, to start building dungeons for themselves. Emboldened by her own words, she turned to our hero and asked him what he thought. Yeah, great plan, very cool, he told her. But he thought she was still too young and stupid. After all, he had been like that once, but he couldn't remember when. There was a time when he led an entire army capable of dominating the entire world. At that time, he was more serious than anyone else about possessing the world's knowledge. There was even a time when he socialized with some people even though he thought they were insignificant. Unfortunately, after that, he went along with his emotions and gave them everything he had. But in the end, he drew the most important conclusion for himself. He realized that all this was going nowhere so he just wanted to sleep. That was his life's purpose. In the next second, he could see the demon queen sleeping on the table, snoring. She didn't listen to him at all and had long since fallen asleep. The next moment, two men were chatting because one of them had forgotten to remove an old announcement with outdated information. Our hero turned his attention to their conversation. One of the men quickly ran over to the bulletin board and immediately posted new information that concerned our hero. If he hadn't, an inspector would have come and find them. The most important information was that the difficulty level of this dungeon was similar to that of dungeons of immense evil. And only those who had experience in such dungeons or had been summoned for such skills were allowed to enter. It also said that the raid would begin within 72 hours of the date of the above quest. Nifrim was chosen to lead the group. It was morning in the city. The bright sun shone into one of the rooms of the cozy hotel. The demon queen slowly woke up and noticed that she had a very bad headache after yesterday. Still yawning, our hero approached her and asked how she was feeling. She replied that she couldn't remember what happened yesterday. But he barely had time to say that this was no surprise after so much beer before he was overcome by a slight horror at what he saw. In the next second, he had collapsed to the floor and was sitting there, staring at the girl with his eyes wide open. The girl didn't understand what was going on and asked him if he was okay. He thought to himself that perhaps his eyesight had deteriorated. Gathering his strength, he was able to ask her a question after a while. Why does she seem so insignificant to him? Indeed, a completely different girl from the day before peered out from under the blanket. It was a baby, basically. His words provoked a fit of rage in the young creature, and the next moment she was already flying towards him, relentlessly pounding on his chest with her fists, screaming that she was not petty, just younger. Doesn't he think he's being too rude? She asked him, but the young man seemed completely oblivious to her blows curious to know why she had suddenly changed so much. Still slapping him hard in the face, she was able to tell him that she hadn't gotten any younger, but that until yesterday she had been a second version of herself so that the wretched humans wouldn't mock her. She paused for a moment and stopped hitting him. This current look is her very real first look. Already quite beaten, with a black eye and a bloody nose, the young man wanted to know if she was really in her true form now. The girl replied that she was. That's right. But not really. She was even able to joke about our hero's swollen face from the beating, asking him if he had eaten without her that night. Our hero grinned after saying that. The girl took back her words and screamed at him, explaining that the transformation was actually the magic of projecting one's future, which meant that when she grew up, she would be just as cool as the second version of herself. She immediately began to smile and laugh and the young man replied that he understood, but continued to sit on the floor. The next moment she was yelling at him again. Did he really understand? The dungeon boss said yes, exactly, although he thought he had better not argue with her or she would hit him again. She was beyond furious because she felt he had misunderstood again. The young man interrupted her and said that she needs new clothes now. She can't go into town dressed like that. She asked him to stop treating her like a little girl. She would not forgive him. He briefly replied that he understood. 
Meanwhile, equally interesting events were taking place in the Count's huge mansion. A large group of warriors arrived at the very gates of this fancy house. It was a raiding party, and they were eager to see the Count. One of the warriors shouted for them to open the gate immediately and meet the group. They had come from another city, and their main goal was to conquer a powerful dungeon. But there was no street noise in the Count's study. He was curious to know who had sent the document. It turned out that this letter was sent yesterday, and it was signed in the name of the Third Eye, a magical unit under the Imperial family. He was very angry at what he heard, and he clenched the paper in his fist with great force. It made him extremely angry that a dungeon raid above Birang needed the approval of the master of those lands first, and these people had just decided everything among themselves and sent him the final terms on paper. And he can't even refuse, because it's almost an imperial order. Turning to his assistant, he wondered what she thought of the situation. Would the troop really be able to pass through the dungeon this time? The girl just shook her head in silence and it was clear from her reaction that she didn't believe in such an outcome. As if he had received a verbal answer from the girl, the Count rose from his chair and said, I have never heard of the leader of this group, Nifrim. In the man's opinion, they are too weak to pass such a powerful dungeon. What the hell do they think they're doing? The Count's indignation never ceases. If this group fails this time, his country will suffer greatly. Perhaps he should send a stronger unit first. He continued his mental analysis to find the best solution for himself. He was still pondering when his assistant turned to him and said that the Count could see the solution right in front of him. At that moment, the man immediately remembered the wizard's tower, where a missing girl had been some time ago, selling her gems. He thought to himself that this tower must have high-quality stones from somewhere. Of course, it was naive to think that this would contribute to their rapid reinforcement, but to raid such a powerful dungeon even with an A-class tower was truly insane. But maybe the rumors weren't false, and they are indeed very powerful, he thought to himself, a slight smile appearing on his face. What if only the most important monster was left in the way of the warriors who had fallen in this dungeon? He finished his thought analysis, and after a moment, he ordered his assistant to send the order to the wing tower immediately. They will promise them huge amounts of money and fame. The main thing is to get them through this dungeon first. But no sooner had they finished their conversation than in the next second someone burst into the room and loudly opened the doors. The guards could do nothing, and three men entered the room. In the lead was Nifrim, a warrior who asked if the Count was really in front of him, accompanied by other glorious warriors. He walked ahead with a confident stride. Outraged, the Count asked who they were, to which the young man replied that he was Nifrim, he called out to him at length, but no one answered, so he had to go in himself. Indignant, the Count asked him what they had forgotten here, even coming unannounced. But the young man didn't seem to pay any attention to his words, and the next thing he knew he was sitting in a fancy chair with one leg tucked behind the other. The warrior informed the Count that he should be aware of this, as they had already received the documents from the Empire. The warrior turned to the Count, and in the next instant his eyes lit up. He looked at him very angrily and asked if there was a reason why they weren't allowed to be here. After all, they were representatives of the Imperial House. The Count lowered his eyes and said in a low voice that there was no such reason. He thought that the little warrior looked like he was about to pounce on him. The green-haired girl said that he had guests, so he should show some respect and bring them all tea, cookies and chocolate. All the while, the Count's assistant stood motionless, waiting for her master's orders. He told her to hurry up and do as they asked. As the two warriors made themselves comfortable on the couch and continued to eat chocolate chip cookies, the Count sat down across from them and wondered what they were doing here, why they had come to see him. The young man replied that they were going to raid this dungeon. The Count, as if not realizing what they had to do, asked them if they really wanted to go there so soon since the document had just arrived and they were already here. With a sarcastic smile, Nifrim replied that they wanted to start today, but they had some plans, so they would probably start their raid tomorrow. The Count wanted to buy himself a few more days, so he tried to talk them out of it. He suggested they rest for a while and said they shouldn't be in such a hurry. 
He promised them good shelter and also promised to throw a welcome party in their honor. The young warrior replied that he could take it easy since they were going to visit Wing Tower first. With a suspicious voice, the Count inquired why. Maybe they're going to see someone they know. The young man replied that not really. In the next second, his face took on a demonic look. With glowing eyes, he looked at the Count and said with a broad smile that they were going to kill everyone in this tower. The Count continued to act like a good actor, wondering what he was trying to tell him, why they wanted to kill everyone. The young man replied that the Count had two lakhs a guard. The mansion is easily bugged with magic, so he knows everything. They came all this way for that dungeon. Does he really think it's fair for someone to beat them to it? Therefore, those little pawns in the tower must be eliminated. The young man smiled after saying these words. The warrior told the count that he preferred this situation because the strongest would go on this raid anyway. The man was ashamed of what he had done earlier, and turning away, he said he would not give the task to anyone else, so they could still leave safely today. Biting off another chocolate chip cookie, the young man thanked the count with a smile and said he was very generous. At that moment, the sound of sword strokes could be heard in the dungeon. The skeleton warrior continued his training, smashing huge stone statues to pieces with his big sword. He realized that time was running out, and the dungeon boss and the girl were still gone. After a while, the dungeon boss and his companion were already outside. The young man was still very sleepy, and his partner was ready for a new adventure. Our hero turned his attention to a huge passage in the wall. It reminded him of his dungeon. They approached one of the warriors and asked him how far it was to the teleportation center. The warrior put his business aside and said that they were only at the exit by the fourth wall. So they have a long way to go to reach the center. The place they need is near the empire, and it is far away. They still had three walls to go. With excitement in his voice, our hero asked how long it would take. The warrior replied that if they walked, it would take about a week. The next second, our heroes were struck with horror at the realization of this fact. They couldn't believe it would take them that long. Our hero thought to himself, This is taking too long. At this rate, the skeleton warrior will run after the girl. His friend suggested that they just fly, but he rejected the idea, because if they started emitting mana, the humans would get wind of everything and find out their intentions and there's no telling what might happen if he used his mana. The next second, a voice called out to them from the side of the place. A man approached them and offered to help them. He was very apologetic about having overheard their conversation, but realized they were going to the city and he could help them. They were curious about who he was. It turned out that the man was a carriage driver and provided transportation services. The girl asked him admiringly if he was really a coachman, to which the man replied that he was, and demonstrated a homunculus he had obtained through alchemy. It was a beautiful creation of the fourth generation, the result of an artificial angel project courtesy of the empire. Such words delighted our hero, although the appearance of this beast did not please the girl. The man went on to praise his animal, saying that it was very strong and docile and could fly, although it had been abandoned because it had once failed to achieve its main goal. Our heroine was curious to know why the Empire had abandoned homunculus research. The man replied that the Empire could not let such a workforce go to waste. Even now there are rumors that such animals are being mass-produced somewhere. Our protagonist asked if they were really made by some process and not grown in giant flasks. The man replied that the young man must be joking, because about 150 years ago they made the first generation of homunculus in a similar way but no one does that anymore. He thought to himself that it had been 150 years since René had been born. While they talked, the girl kept examining the carriage. She was curious how long it would take to fly to the teleportation center. The coachman replied that the flight would take three hours, and the check-in would take another hour, so a total of about four hours. And the checkpoint has to be done every time you go through all the walls. After all this talk, our heroes were curious to know how much such a flight would cost. With an enthusiastic voice and a broad smile, the man replied that such a trip would cost them eight ounces of gold for two. The next second, they were horrified again, and they were more than surprised, 
because the dungeon boss had only paid eight ounces of silver for the previous night, and this man was asking for eight ounces of gold, that's eight hundred ounces of silver, that's one hundred times more. So they started going through their clothes and looking in all their pockets for some coins. And the next second, there was a kind of jingling sound in our protagonist's pocket. They were the coins that the skeleton warrior had left for him earlier. After a while, their carriage with the magic beast was already flying high above the busy city. Looking at the city from above, the girl asked him where he got such a large sum of money, and who gave it to him. He replied that it was one of his comrades. She still couldn't understand how he could move so easily as a monster. Our hero was in no mood for conversation, so he replied briefly that he had been thrown out of the dungeon. Would that answer do for her? He just wanted to sleep. It was a very comfortable carriage, and their flight went quite smoothly. The girl was curious to know if the comrade he was looking for had also been thrown out. The young man answered lazily. Yes, sort of. She envied him, for he continued to look after this man, even though they had both been thrown out. She wished she had friends like that. She would want someone to take care of her, too, and she would do it herself in return. How great that must be, she told him. Yes, of course it's great. Our hero pretended to listen to her, but he turned over to the other side and prepared to sleep. After a while, they arrived at their destination. The buildings in the city were quite different from the empire's holdings on the outskirts. Here, the roofs of the buildings were covered with gold, and all the streets were paved with special expensive tiles. Our hero asked in surprise, couldn't they use the teleportation center now? The receptionist apologized for the inconvenience, and said that unfortunately they could not use their services today. The man went on to tell them that if they were not in a hurry, they could come back tomorrow at 8 p.m. The center is not open because the city is holding an auction today. He held out a newspaper with an announcement about the event. After the auction, he added, VIP guests will be using the center, so someone higher up will probably give permission. Our hero asked in surprise, Did they close the center for an auction? The man replied that yes, because this time there was a very important item on display. And it's for security reasons, to prevent the auction from being attacked by the teleportation center. This time, something very special was on the auction block. It was Danda's teeth. 34 out of 36 masterpieces. The young man noticed that he recognized something familiar in the object. He almost shouted out the name of his missing friend, but immediately came to his senses and said that it was the same item his comrade had used. His eyes widened in surprise and a cold sweat ran down his back. He couldn't believe that this item was up for auction. He pretended to understand what the man was talking about and assured the receptionist that this thing could be used to strike different blows. The administrator replied that he was not fully aware of the effect of the item, but that the young man was most likely mistaken. The man added that there were no more items like this. It was the only one of its kind. The only one. And in the next second, our hero had already grabbed his head, and now it was definitely clear to him that this was the weapon of the missing René. His partner, Realizing that something was wrong with him, was upset and turned to him, asking if he was okay. Our hero continued to think to himself, paying no attention to her questions. Could humans really defeat her? It can't be, because even the bosses of other dungeons can't touch Renee. This girl is very strong, she's not just some maid with a blade. He began to remember the time she escaped from the dungeon. Did she really have a blade at that moment? No, she was wearing luxurious clothes, there was no place to hide a weapon. Besides, it was one of the daggers she threw at him when she considered him an enemy. He tried to figure out how many blades she had left. She always had at least five pieces with her when she encountered humans. The skeleton warrior was already strong, he had his own sword, so he didn't need an additional weapon. But here's Renee, the girl with silver hair. What would happen if you took that wonderful blade away from her? Fear gripped his companion, because in the next second, our hero began to turn into a giant monster. He couldn't control his emotions anymore. He seemed to realize that his friend had been killed by these wretched, lowly people, these little creatures. Did she really die at their hands? 
our hero thought to himself that if Rene really died at the hands of humans, maybe he should eliminate them as well? By this time, the administrator was already on the ground, a terrible horror had taken hold of his face, and with his last breath he shouted with all his might that the monster should not approach him. But in the next second he was dead. The young man had almost completely transformed into the giant monster. As if his friend was still there, he talked to her for a while. But someone's voice was getting louder and louder nearby, someone trying to get through to him, trying to get him to come to his senses and stop all this. It was his companion, the Demon Queen. She tugged hard at his sleeve. Still in his monster state, he turned to her. She wanted to ask him what had happened, she wanted answers. But the young man kept telling himself about one of his thirty-six masterpieces, the Dandu Teeth. They were the only ones in the world. After a while, he turned back into an ordinary young man. And as far as the Demon Queen understood, this was truly a unique thing. She wanted to know what he was so angry about, why. He replied that it was his comrade's item and he had to return it. He then pulled his arm away and started to leave, saying that she had helped him enough, so she could go. He had found a way to get into town on his own, so he would go on from here. They had to get out of here quickly people might come screaming. In that second, the demon queen seemed to realize everything. She called out to him, telling him that she knew who he was looking for. It was a girl. It was the same silver-haired dungeon monster who used the Dandu teeth, one of the thirty-six masterpieces, as a weapon. Renee's blade made. The girl realized she was right, judging by his reaction. He asked her not to provoke her unnecessarily as he was in no condition to talk to her right now. He turned to her and said with the voice of a giant monster that she wanted to know too much. Maybe it's time to stop. But his voice only seemed to amuse the girl. She replied that she didn't really want to know any more and that she wasn't afraid when he spoke to her with that voice. She already knew who he really was. Rene is the gatekeeper who protects the great dungeon, the ultimate creature. Since he calls this girl a comrade, everything becomes clear at once. After all, this is the great boss of the dungeon, Mr. Swallow. By this time, the young man had already regained his usual youthful appearance. He almost said his real name and thought she had guessed everything, but the next second the girl interrupted him. Laughing out loud, the demon queen said that he was his subordinate. She had figured it all out. Our hero exhaled with some relief. He felt better. She laughed and said that she solved it because she has a very developed mind. So she understands exactly what he's going to do. He's going to take revenge. And it's a dangerous enough undertaking. She will help him and no objections will be accepted. He finally managed to get some words out of her, telling her that she was a demon queen after all. Could she really go where she wanted because of such logic? Still laughing, she replied that you can't become a demon queen by being rational but what she says becomes logic. That's not much of an excuse, our hero thought. Oh my God, it's that face again, exclaimed the girl. He looked at her with his surprised eyes, but she laughed anyway, saying that she recognized her familiar friend now. He was so scary, really scary, and there were some black things coming out of his back. The girl emotionally described his recent transformation into a monster. And she's very happy that he's back in the way he used to be. He doesn't have to worry about anything else because now he has her with him. She came quite close to him and took his hand and asked him not to speak to her in that horrible voice again. After a while, our heroes approached the building where the auction was to take place. It was a fancy, expensive building decorated with gold, and the people who attended it represented the aristocracy and nobility of the city. Meanwhile, the back entrance of this building was not at all noticeable to the common public, and as expected, there were not many guests here. There was only one guard guarding the entrance. The next moment, someone approached him and greeted him. Not long ago, the girl, now a beautiful member of a noble family, told the guard that she wanted to participate in the auction and asked him to pass. She was dressed incredibly expensively, with gold earrings and a diamond pendant around her neck. Still surprised, the guard didn't expect to see these people at the back entrance. 
He said they had to go through a background check first. The girl gave her fictitious name and said she represented a very famous family, and at her side was her servant. The guard quickly checked his logbook, but found no record of these guests. The girl replied that there was no such thing. Must have been a mix-up, but they still have an invitation to the event. What other invitation? The guard asked in surprise. There is no invitation for this event. But as soon as he had finished speaking, our hero approached him and struck him on the head with his fist. This is your invitation to the afterlife, our hero said. After that, they paid no attention to the guard lying nearby, and our hero noticed the new appearance of his friend. To which she replied that yes, she liked her look herself. But isn't he afraid he could easily fall in love with her now? They walked towards the entrance, still arguing about the fact that she was a child and he couldn't love her. She continued to pound his back with her fists. Meanwhile, in the gloomy and cold castle, in a spacious and stone room, in a gorgeous bed, lay Renée. She couldn't stop saying out loud that she was now unlikely to be able to go back to the dungeon again. Eighty years ago, a terrible fire destroyed most of the forest. It wasn't just a forest. Someone comforted his grandmother. He didn't think humans were capable of such a thing. This someone tried to calm the woman down by telling her that the forest would recover quickly and she would be happy again. Isn't that right? This grandmother was the mistress of the forest, nicknamed the witch the spirit of the earth. She paid those people with the same coin that they came to her with. She destroyed them all. The anger still overwhelmed her heart, and she couldn't forget what had happened. The man who calmed her down was our main character. This forest served as a natural fortress around his dungeon. He had to behave with dignity in her presence. She helped him a lot. This woman killed all the people who committed arson. Her rage should gradually subside, he told himself. But the next second he felt the presence of a creature sitting in a cage nearby. And that someone in the cage had no connection to the arsonists. And the longer our hero looked at her, the more he marveled at her. Isn't someone like her called a homunculus? He asked himself. Inside the cage was a little girl with green eyes. She was a creature made by humans, but she was not human. Our hero, either half-human or half-monster, thought it was worth killing her, too, because there's no good in witnesses. However, he remembered the words of the man he had recently killed. It was his last will, the will of her master. You are free! He shouted at her. So you can go! Perhaps for the first time in a long time, our hero felt like doing just that. He felt some pity and compassion for her. But that didn't mean he would help her get out of here. She didn't care if she died here or outside the forest. With a slight effort, he opened the huge metal bars of the cage. Well, the choice was hers. Now she had to decide what to do. Still sitting on the cold stone floor, she looked up at him with her big green eyes, posing no threat. After all, she was a child, a little girl. Our hero told her that her master was looking for his maid, and since there were no other maids here, she must be the one. Whereupon he declared that his mercy ended here, turned around, and started to walk away. The girl followed him with her gaze, slowly stepping out of the cage and softly saying her name, and as he walked away, a trail of huge cobblestones flew in all directions. The name she spoke was that of a maid who assisted the head of the family she served. Or rather, it could be considered a title, for it was the name given to the most distinguished maid. Carefully, the girl stepped out of the cage with her bare feet. Gomonkal had no right to be treated like this, so the maid who served this family was a middle-aged woman. For this family, the girl was just another thing, and since that is the case, things don't get names. But she decided something for herself in that second, and her eyes lit up with hope. And we are brought back to our current reality, where Renée was sitting at the foot of a huge mountain next to a large castle. She looked down in silence as the mistress of the castle approached her and informed her that a team sent by the Empire was on its way to this dungeon for another raid. The woman felt very sorry for the little girl. Renée replied that even though she said the dungeon was in danger, she couldn't go back there. The woman replied that she wasn't asking her to go back. This little girl's happiness was important to her, freedom of choice was a priority. 
She tried to convince her that she shouldn't burn all her bridges at once, because these two would travel across the continent to find her. She couldn't hide for that long. And if they find out that she has been tricked by humans, they will all be destroyed literally immediately. So if she's going to stay here, hiding from everyone, she's going to have to erase her tracks so that no one will ever find her again. Forever. The woman kept telling her that it wasn't necessary to do it perfectly, because when the skeleton warrior realized everything, he would make the right choice anyway. So she still had some time and a chance, while the raid on this most powerful dungeon would begin in the next few days. Everyone will be busy. Now is the best time to wrap things up. But as soon as she finished, she was interrupted by this little girl. She abruptly jumped up from her seat and said she couldn't just sit here anymore. She needed to take a walk, get some fresh air. The woman noticed that her right eye had become slightly cloudy. Wouldn't she like it to go with her as a helper and for safety's sake? The little creature thanked her friend for welcoming her so graciously into her castle and told her not to worry about her. All she cared about was the whereabouts of her weapons, her blades. We are transported to the building where the auction took place. Our protagonist has one of the guards of the place pinned down. He had a tight grip on the man's neck, and it was clear from his expression that things were bad. Our hero wanted to know everything the man knew about Danda's teeth. The man could barely speak and struggled to say that the item was displayed from the wing tower. He knows nothing else. He begged to be spared and kept alive. Our hero thought that this was very interesting information. Is the wing mage tower really involved in this? He abruptly pulled his hand away and the man fell to the ground from a great height. He thanked the guard for his honesty and said that he would let him live for it. The man saw them off with a glance and came to his senses. It was unclear to him what his fault was. I mean, he's just a security guard, and they're some kind of crazy people. He repeated this several times, but it seems to have been in vain, as he once again caught our hero's attention. The young man approached him and his eyes lit up with monster fire again. Does this man really think he's innocent? And in the next second, to the horror of the man sitting near the wall, our protagonist began to transform back into a monster. The main character was angered by the guard's words that he was supposedly innocent. He reminded him that people say things like that when they come onto his property. He said that people always use words like conquering the land, or conquering another dungeon, or some raid, but never once have they called it a massacre. As he continued to talk to this man, he gradually turned into a huge monster, and the end of this guard was near. Have these people never felt remorse for killing monsters? How did the dungeon dwellers deserve to be treated like this? What did they do wrong? He added that he would play by their own rules, since they were enemies. Meanwhile, in the main hall of the exquisite building, an auction was being held. In this luxurious room, everyone was trying to place their bets. The air was filled with the shouts of the audience. Everyone was trying to outdo each other for the right to own a very unique item. There were two people watching the noisy crowd from the side. They might have wanted to participate in the auction as well, but their job was to protect the place. They were members of an order of knights called the Black Wolf. The girl seemed to joke a bit about participating in the auction, and her colleague reminded her of their main mission here. As they thought about getting the auction over with, a man on stage shouted loudly and asked if there were any more bids. He then announced loudly to the entire audience that the lot would be sold in three bills. But the next second, someone from above shouted at him. Why all of a sudden? asked a demonic voice. Huge dark tentacles began to crawl onto the stage. A second later, the man was already dead, and our protagonist declared that only he had the right to end the auction. He was beyond angry and addressed the audience in a terrifying voice. Did you really come here to buy Danda's teeth? This chapter is about heroes. There are only three heroes in the Empire. Unfortunately, one of them is already dead. He died in a dangerous dungeon while fighting the monster that was our main character. Therefore, after his death, the public criticized the others, saying that he died because of his pride. Although he was a hero, his first priority was to protect the people. And the anger of the crowd, which was originally directed at the dead hero, was naturally transferred to the remaining two living heroes. 
and one of those two characters is a young girl with an iron glove on her hand. She had to regain the trust of the people of the Empire. But she didn't dare to attack the huge monster standing on the stage. Her fighting spirit was overwhelmed by the instinct of self-preservation screaming from within. She was almost ready to enter the battle, but she was stopped by someone's hand. It was her trusty battle buddy who said there was no way they could interfere right now. Terror and fear gripped the two girls as they realized how powerful and dangerous the monster on stage was. At that moment, our protagonist approached the pedestal where the object he had been searching for so long was hidden under a crystal hood. He couldn't believe that this blade was the one he was looking for and that it was real. For a second he thought it might be a fake, but Renée's footprints were clearly visible. It was her weapon. With a slight movement of his fingers he tilted back the crystal container that covered the weapon. If he only found out that the girl had died at the hands of these people, he would destroy everyone sitting in the hall right now. He turned to the crowd and said that it would be difficult for him to explain the situation that was happening, but he assured them that this weapon had an owner. He was filled with anger and rage. Sure, he felt a little bad that these people would give away such fabulous money, but he should be believed. At this time, the crowd in the hall fell backwards in horror at what they had just seen. Some of the men in the audience shouted loudly for the guards to waste no time in restoring order. We must catch this man on stage at all costs, yelled one of the men. Hearing this, our hero told them that since they didn't want to let him go, it was up to them. He wanted it himself, and is ready to destroy them all. He's ready to take this building and run them all into the ground with it. He was about to attack the people sitting in the front rows, but in the next second, someone came down from above with a loud scream. It was the same warrior girl, the hero, who had been standing in the distance earlier, reluctant to enter the fray. Our hero noted that she had pretty good moves and weapons, though he disparagingly called her a flying squirrel. Well, her first blow missed him. Too clumsily, our hero thought to himself. He stood still and turned his attention to her gloves. Is that really all she has? This time, the girl prepared for another strike. Fear gripped her entire body, but she had no choice since her duel had already begun. She swung her arm hard and flew towards our hero. In return, he thought, he'd just break her arms. Although she was not bad for a human, she was no danger to him, our hero thought. At that moment, the girl activated the special method of her weapon called crushing. The next second, her fist flew towards our hero, who was about to grab her glove with his hand. At that moment, his eyes widened in surprise, and in the next second, he was thrown a long distance into the wall, and huge chunks of concrete and marble were scattered around. It was a very powerful blow from the girl, so powerful that she worried about the safety of her weapon. From afar, somewhere deep in the clouds of raised dust, our hero pronounced that she was not so simple. Much to the surprise of the girl, who had expected him to die after such a blow. Horror gripped her again, and she couldn't understand how he could still be alive. It simply couldn't be. This technique wouldn't even leave a mark on most dungeon bosses. To her dismay, the glove that normally held three blows fell apart into one. Her primary weapon was completely destroyed. She looked at the creature and couldn't figure out who he was. Maybe he's not human. Some kind of black liquid? Or maybe it's gas? It didn't look like a normal monster. Then what is he? The girl wondered as she watched her enemy slowly get to his feet. The next second, he laughed out loud in his demonic voice and said he was sorry. It's a shame that this girl has to die right now. But someone had called to her. Someone was about to come to her rescue. It was her battle teammate who ran forward with great speed to attack. She was determined to strike, and huge, bright blue flashes of lightning began to come out of her hand. Some time later, our hero was sitting in the ruins of an auction house. Standing next to him was the demon queen, who was very concerned about what had just happened. She wanted to know if he was okay. He quickly replied that he was fine and that she could rest easy. After everything she had seen, after the building had been leveled by a huge explosion, she thought he was already dead, so tears rolled down her cheeks. The young man looked at her and said he was fine. 
To himself, he remembered that the punch of that girl was not made by an ordinary person, because if it hit him in the heart, then definitely nothing good would happen to him. It would just scare him even more and he might turn into a huge monster again. She scared him. He'd better be dead, he thought. He felt ashamed, because if the skeleton warrior found out about this, he would get a lot of criticism. He suddenly came to his senses and looked somewhere in the distance, realizing that he had missed these two heroes. He could not defeat them in this battle. He still called them flying squirrels. There were two of them, especially the one with pink hair. While she distracted him, the other one with the blue hair evacuated everyone and even gave her several layers of protective magic. He had not expected this kind of behavior from humans at all. He was eager for a new experience. A sarcastic smile appeared on his face and he said, How funny! Shards of the destroyed building still fell to the ground, and the townspeople realized that something had collapsed somewhere, that something had happened. Some couldn't even understand what was going on. The crowd turned to the girl lying on the ground. Everyone wanted to help her. She clearly needed help. One of the men shouted loudly for security to be called. No, I'd rather have a doctor. The girl was unconscious for a while. She was unable to speak. She's a hero. She thought to herself. But she was thrown to the ground by a monster whose name she doesn't even know. She was curious to know if the people from the auction were okay, if they had all had time to evacuate. The people around her helped her up and she told them her name. They all recognized her as their hero. It seemed to her that they spoke to her very quietly. In fact, she was a little dazed from the fight she just had, and there was still a ringing in her head. At that time, her pink-haired friend approached her with a slight smile on her face. They were very happy to see each other. Immediately, the blue-haired girl had tears streaming down her cheeks. Of course, this brave girl should have thanked her friend, because if it wasn't for her, the preparations for her funeral would be in full swing right now. Tears were still streaming from her eyes. She looked at her friend and said a small thank you in a trembling voice. She was curious what had become of her hand. It was clear that her friend had lost her arm in the battle. Being a brave and courageous warrior, or perhaps because they were in the presence of other people, her friend replied that she was fine, that her life was not in danger. Although sweat continued to pour down her face, she found it difficult to speak. The next second, the girl threw herself on her neck and told her to forgive her. Tears flowed from her eyes even more. She'll probably be removed as a hero now, since she's the reason why all this happened. But the pink-haired hero girl pulled her friend back sharply and told her to clean herself up. She's a hero after all. If the hero of the Empire acts like a show-off, does she really think people will like it? You have to be strong. After a while, when they had calmed down, the girl informed her that an arm was only a small casualty of what had happened to them. She needs to know who her real opponent was in this fight. It was Swallow, the boss of this most powerful dungeon. The young warrior thought her friend must be joking. It's not funny to hear such words. Why would such a powerful monster come here among humans? But with a very stern voice, her friend replied that she didn't know the reasons, but that he had come here that was for sure, it was definitely him. Black Catastrophe The old monster of Swallow She could tell it was him because there was a pile of dead heroes' footprints at his feet. They were fresh, less than a month old. So the situation is much worse than they thought. If things continue like this, the Empire might come to an end. Only now did the girl realize what had really happened. She sat on the ground in utter confusion. And in a second, she was seized with horror, and with a loud cry she began to say, If it really was him, they must make even more effort. This is the land of the people, here they have the advantage. Her friend reassured the young girl again, and told her that this was not a problem they could solve on their own. She had felt this intense fear herself, which was why they needed help. The more experienced warrior explains that there is no chance of victory now. She will go to the dungeon raid command center and ask for reinforcements. Afterwards, she will report on the situation of the imperial family. In her current state, it would be difficult to teleport two people, so this girl must stay here. 
In the next second, she had already activated her light healing magic, causing the girl's shoulder to burn slightly. Unfortunately, she told her she couldn't heal her completely, so she shouldn't hang around the city and should wait for the main forces to arrive. And in the next instant, the woman began to bounce off the ground as she activated her ability to teleport to another location. Looking in her direction, the girl on the ground shouted that this monster could appear at any moment and come back here, but she was told to wait anyway. The hero flew up somewhere and kept repeating that no matter what happened, she shouldn't go anywhere, she should stay here and wait with the rest of the warriors. A second later, the girl disappeared somewhere high in the sky. Meanwhile, Standing in front of the ruins of the once beautiful building, our hero continued to think to himself that everything had somehow turned out very unfortunate. He didn't know what to do next. Maybe he should just leave the runaways behind and head for the city. Or would it be better to catch up with the dangerous ones and get rid of them? And while he pondered what to do next, the demon queen watched his actions. Well, he seems to have made up his mind. Now that he's got Dundas' teeth back we can stop there. Still, he has an underlying purpose that should not be forgotten. He has to find Renée, even if it is only her dead body. Then he turned to his friend and told her to get ready because they were leaving. But this time, his partner seemed less than enthusiastic, and there was a slight wistfulness and sadness on her face. Our hero didn't understand what was wrong with her. Like any girl in such a situation, she replied that nothing had happened to her, and that he shouldn't worry. But he insisted and asked her to answer his question and tell him what was wrong with her. She looked down and said in a low voice, the look on his face telling him. With some trepidation, she turned to him and said he was very strong. She noticed that the moment she'd seen him in the castle. And the more she got to know him, the stronger he proved to be, exceeding her expectations. She was a little afraid of what she saw. Her hands even seemed to tremble slightly. Even though he called himself a comrade of the girl he was looking for, he looks much more powerful than her. Maybe I'm wrong, the demon queen said, or maybe Renée is really much stronger than I know. Now, she insisted that he answer her question. Who are you? She turned to him and looked straight into his eyes. And in the next second our hero found nothing better than to scratch the back of his head and to bring her to her senses with a light fist blow on her friend's head. He tried to cheer her up, telling her that she was his favorite little silly girl and that she didn't need to be so down in the dumps. He'll be sure to tell her the whole truth after they've taken care of everything. You just have to wait a little longer. Then he turned the conversation to another topic and suggested that she clean up the place so that she could show him the power of a demon queen. With a quick flick of her hand, the girl threw her cloak aside, and in the next instant, she reappeared in her second incarnation as the most beautiful demon queen. After a moment, she had already activated her special reconstruction magic. A huge pink orb enveloped the space around our heroes. Loud peals of thunder and a flash of pink light could be seen and heard in the distance throughout the city. Then there was an explosion so powerful that the shockwave spread for miles around. Panic and terror gripped the people. No one could figure out what was going on. Everyone could see a huge column of smoke rising in the shape of a large mushroom, where the real battle with the demon had just taken place. The hero girl, who was watching everything that was happening, couldn't believe her eyes. She knew the place because she had just been there. It was an auction. And it was in the heart of the capital. Someone from the crowd shouted that this was his home. Does this monster have no idea how many people can live in a capital city? Does he really want to raise this place to the ground? She didn't know what to do, as an older comrade had ordered her to stay here and wait for the main force to arrive. But deep inside, as a true warrior... She was still ready to go and protect all the townspeople. She almost left her seat and went forward, but at that moment she was stopped by a little boy who told her that his father was there. After that, all doubts fell away and she ran forward with great vigor. The person reassured everyone that everything was fine, that they shouldn't worry, and that she would totally figure it out. The girl put her iron gauntlet back on and began to stride toward the center of town. She won't lose to this monster. The clouds of smoke and dust dissipated, 
and now not only was the auction house itself completely destroyed, but many nearby structures as well. It was nothing but ruins. Somewhere amidst all the rocks and debris, our protagonist's foot appeared. Barely out of the rubble, he turned to his girlfriend, who had made this huge mess, with an angry voice. He was very curious as to what kind of magic she had used to destroy so many structures. The demon queen replied that it was a special reconstruction magic, a supreme earth-shattering magic. Doesn't he like the order and cleanliness she just brought? Still flying through the air, she laughingly pointed to the ruins where houses once stood. Our hero asked in an annoyed voice, Why doesn't she have something more appropriate for the occasion? The girl replied that he needn't blame her. Hadn't he asked her to clean up the place? He was hinting at using the most powerful spell, wasn't he? I think she got everything mixed up again. She descended to the ground and sat down on a large rock in front of him. Still shaking the dust from his clothes, he looked at her in silence. She added that it should have been explained in detail how she was supposed to do it. So he couldn't complain now. He replied that he thought she understood. The next second, our hero felt the approach of a large group of men. The situation is getting more heated. Then he turned to his friend and asked her if she remembered the way to the teleport. Of course, the girl replied cheerfully. I remember exactly, she said. He asked her to go there right away and protect the teleport, because people would run there now and he had something else to do. She didn't understand such an abrupt change in his behavior and had absolutely no idea what he was up to. He asked her to get everything ready because as soon as he returned, they would go to the city. The girl nodded her head. Then she shouted back that she had absolutely no idea where this town was. The young man turned around and asked her if she knew the coordinates of his dungeon. With great pomp, the girl declared that of course she did, for, as she had said before, this was her favorite dungeon of all. But the young man didn't let her finish and told her that this was the closest town to his dungeon. After thinking for a while, the demon queen added that she actually only knew about this dungeon from books. Our hero realized a long time ago that she's making a lot of things up. After that, he turned around and walked away, and she soared up on her magical pink wings, saying that she would fly to defend the teleporter from the humans. He approached the edge of the once large neighborhood, now a solid ruin, and noticed a group of men emerging from the haze. There were quite a few of them, but he couldn't count them all because they were still hidden by the dust and smoke of the destruction. One of the warriors began to speak, saying that they belonged to one of the nine pillars of the empire. It was a punitive unit of the ranger family called the Blue Crane. A man with a mask on his face and a scar over his left eye introduced himself and said he was Casper, the squad leader. And who are you? He turned to our hero. The young man looked at them in silence for a while, thinking once again that these people were all dressed to the nines, as usual. And why are they always like that? Actually, he's not surprised that so many people have come here, because it's probably the wars of someone who attended the auction earlier. And after a pause, he spoke. In a low voice, addressing this crowd, he said, If you want to know who I am, I will tell you now. I am your enemy. His eyes once again glowed with yellow light, and he began to transform into a huge, vicious monster. The fate of this group was sealed. Meanwhile, in the dungeon where only one skeleton warrior remained, equally interesting events were taking place. Another group of warriors came this way, led by Nifrim. Someone turned to him and said, Of all those who have entered this cave, none have returned alive. And if they die here, their soul will be corrupted and wander the world until the end of time. The young warrior obviously didn't like what he heard. It was his companion, a warrior girl with green hair. She was afraid to go any further and suggested that he go back. Isn't he afraid of what's going on here? He asked her not to joke like that because it was very serious, to which the girl replied that he was very boring and she would continue to joke. But the next second, they were approached by one of the warriors who said that this place seemed rather suspicious to him, because the first room they went through had a pile of monster corpses, while this room they were in now was very clean. Thanks to the magic used by the mages in their party, they could see far around them. Yellow orbs of light flew and swirled in the sky, 
lighting their way into this dark cave. The seasoned warrior and mage sensed that something was amiss. Obviously, someone had cleaned up and was waiting for their visit. But the rest of the team didn't seem to realize that something very strange and sinister was going on here. They were still trying to figure out who could have cleaned this place up. Obviously not a team from the past during their passing offensive. Maybe there's some kind of monster with intelligence here. And while the group of warriors continued to argue and discuss the reason for the lack of corpses in this room, Nifrim silently watched from the sidelines and began to suspect that someone was waiting for their visit and watching everything from the outside. In the next second, he turned around and shouted loudly somewhere off to the side that he had stopped mocking them and that this monster wouldn't be able to fool them no matter how hard he tried. His yell was so loud that the reverberation of his voice echoed throughout this vast dungeon for a long time. Then, from somewhere far away, someone spoke to them and said that this young man's voice was too high. This someone's bones were even shaking. Anyway, no one fooled them. He cleaned up the place because he hated to see that messy room. They couldn't see who it was, but they could see the glow of two small blue lights in the distance. Nifrim quickly ordered his friend to light the new magic orbs. They needed light to see this monster. And in the next second, a skeleton warrior appeared in front of their eyes and said that he was very happy to meet them. In a mocking tone, he added that it had become quite bright. Although he didn't call out to them, he was very happy that they were able to come to such a precious place. Well done, you miserable humans, the skeleton warrior said. Nifrim knew who was standing before him. He turned around and asked him, Are you really that death knight? The skeleton warrior teased him again, saying that he was very surprised to be recognized. After all, he had worked so hard all day to introduce and present himself properly. Thank you, humans, the monster said. After that, he suggested that they surrender because he thought they were too bloodthirsty. The warriors should lay down their fists and weapons, and the mages should put away their wands. But no sooner had the skeleton finished speaking than the next second, the warrior rushed to attack. With tremendous force, he tried to strike his blade directly at the skeleton's head. But his attack was easily stopped by the monster's hand. Joking again, the skeleton warrior said that they had no manners at all, and they didn't even let him catch his breath. But this mage didn't want to stop, so in the next instant, huge ice spikes flew at the monster. It was a gigantic avalanche, like a wave. But the skeleton warrior didn't seem afraid at all, saying that fighting the crowd alone wasn't in his plans. Nevertheless, the victory would be his. But this warrior had no intention of stopping. He struck one blow after another. That's why he was able to knock that monster down. After that, the skeleton warrior's sword flew to the side. What an unexpected development, the monster thought. Oh, impressive for a human, how he would praise this warrior. In the next instant, with an acid smile, the young man began to use most of the spells he had prepared. Strong body, omen reading, light feather, silent step, boiling blood, ashes from the bones of a famous warrior. He recited one spell after another. But this monster didn't seem to be afraid of any of his spells and realized that they couldn't last long. He grabbed the hilt of his sword. Then he pretended to be affected by all those spells. He thought to himself that he only had to hold out for a minute. And do nothing for now. Bright flashes illuminated everything around them. One spell after the other changed. And it seemed as if they really worked on him, because the monster sat motionless. The young man came quite close and put his boot on the skeleton. He pinned it to the ground and asked, What does he think? Who is going to beat who today? For what seemed like the first time in his cave life, the skeleton warrior screamed in despair, unable to believe that magic could bring him to a stalemate. This warrior, as well as the rest of the party, had not expected the battle to end so easily. This dungeon isn't as scary as they say. Nifrim thought to himself. The skeleton tried to say something, but the warrior ordered him to shut up. Then he prepared a crushing blow and tried to stab the skeleton in the eye with a cry of, die. However, in the next second, his powerful strike was easily stopped by the skeleton warrior's three fingers. The next moment, the skeleton laughed out loud as he lay on the ground, 
saying that he had gotten into his role very well this time. Horror gripped the young man, and a cold sweat ran down his back. He realized that all his efforts were in vain. Again, the skeleton said mockingly that he had been very bored the last few years, so he wanted to experience something new. So he tried acting. In a demonic voice, he thanked them for playing along. The very next second, his eyes began to glow even brighter, which did not bode well for the warriors who came here. As if waking from a nightmare, Nifrim found himself sitting alone on the wet stone floor of this dim cave. The skeleton told him that it was over in the few seconds he was unconscious. He pointed in the direction of the pile of corpses. These were the people who had met their end at the hands of a death knight. No one has ever made it out of here alive. The skeleton told him that he was surprised by his complete lack of understanding of his abilities. Then he pointed to the green-haired sorceress, who was difficult to deal with. Nifrim, who had already come to his senses, was surprised by the horrible scene. He clung with his hands to the breathless body of the girl he loved so much. Warrior Skeleton said he never thought she could use sacred magic. His bones still itch. Of course, he said all this with utter contempt for a wizard whose fate was sealed. Skeleton continued to taunt the warrior, telling him that his girlfriend had called his name out loud before she died. She called him to her. She called him so desperately, but unfortunately no one could help her, and she died. Skeleton had hoped for a more violent reaction from the young man but there was none. Is he really that heartless? The skeleton warrior wondered. He then drew his sword to finish off the warrior in front of him. In skeleton's opinion, he was very stupid for sending thirty people to their deaths. No offense, but his troops were below average. With his huge and sharp sword he touched his neck to ask questions. He's very kind and polite, skeleton said, so he'd give him a choice. If he wanted to answer— he had to raise his right hand slightly. If he refused to answer a question, he should raise his left hand. The next second, the young man began to raise his right arm to the delight of Skeleton, who called it a wise decision and offered to kill him painlessly. But suddenly the young man gave him the middle finger, and Skeleton declared that he was being rather rude even now. He then raised his sword and declared that he respected his decision, so he would kill him slowly. A second later, he plunged his weapon into the young man's body, piercing it through and through. Would Skeleton have to clean up this pile of corpses again? He wanted to do it faster this time. But it seemed that this heroic mage wasn't going to give up just yet. He waited for Skeleton to leave. All the while, he pretended to be dead. His gaze was overwhelmed by the desire for revenge and the horrible scene he saw before his eyes. Droplets of blood fell on his girlfriend's face. He leaned even closer to her to apologize for everything that had happened and for what he was about to do to her. Then he shouted loudly that he had to survive. But the skeleton wasn't so stupid and continued to listen to his monologue while standing behind a stone wall. Much to skeleton's surprise, the next second he saw a horrifying sight. Like a completely desperate vampire, the young man was pouncing on this victim. Skeleton thought to himself. This young man must be very hungry. Is he really doing this to get stronger and recover? There were quite a few fallen heroes, so Skeleton decided to watch for a while. He was curious to know what the source of this warrior's power was. Magic or perhaps alchemy? After that, he started to think about his boss, whom he was really looking forward to and hoped that he wouldn't do anything stupid in unknown places and we are transported back to the city, where our hero is engaged in another battle. To his surprise, he discovers a girl he fought with at the auction house behind his back. Has she come to die too? But she had another plan. She shouted her name loudly and said she was going to defeat him. Sure, our hero was a little impressed by her fighting spirit, but he didn't care what her name was because she would never beat him. In response, the young girl prepared to deliver a crushing blow. She was determined to stop our hero at any cost. With great speed, her iron gauntlet flew towards our hero, but he easily stopped her hand with his palm. Then he angrily grabbed her arms and told her that he would not let her hit him again, but that she could try to run away if she succeeded. The girl was horrified, 
and the next second he threw her to the ground with tremendous force. She screamed in pain and must have been badly hurt. Shards of stone flew in all directions. Deep inside she still hoped that she could by some time, after all, a hero should act according to his status. Standing on the ruins of the burning building, our hero lifted her by her iron glove with an easy movement. Is that really all she can do? She could barely speak, and her entire body was covered in blood. After that, she declared that she couldn't just lose and let him into the city to face the people of the empire. And the next second, with a loud scream, she was about to give him a powerful blow with her right hand, gathering all her magic power into that fist. She is a hero and should protect innocent people, but unfortunately her hand, which barely touched our monster's skin, stopped and did no damage. The young man told her that she would not die in vain and that he would try to remember her name, at least for a while. The next moment he threw her aside with a mighty blow. And as a tribute to her persistence, he intended to end it painlessly. But suddenly, to our hero's great surprise, several blows flew at him from somewhere to the side. He turned around to see a group of warriors who had come to fight him. Some of them started to help the girl to protect her. Our hero mockingly declared that if they all wanted to die, they should all die at once, together, not one by one. But there were special forces warriors who also sarcastically stated that they had to use such drastic methods to save their charge, so they apologized for their rude behavior. Did they really think that throwing something at the back of his head would get them out of here so easily? According to our hero, they will get the punishment they deserve. However, one of the warriors approached our hero and said that he was a member of a knightly order called the Black Wolf, and he wanted an audience with him. This knight's face reflected complete confidence in his actions. Does this knight dare to call him by his first name? The young man explained that his ward had a special ability that helped him recognize our hero. However, our monster was not in the best of moods and thought that the person in front of him was very smug. In an ominous voice, he told the group that they were wasting their time. If they were going to attack, they'd better do it sooner rather than later. He then began to transform into a monster. However, the young knight said that they had no intention of fighting him, but wanted to offer him a deal. That's their main goal. These words further enraged our hero who told them with his sinister voice of a scary monster that he really looked like he was missing something. He advised them to take a sober look at the situation. Our hero recommended that they stop mocking him, or else they would die an extremely painful death. However, the young knight was not even deterred by the terrifying sight of the giant monster that appeared before him. Sure, it was a complete gamble, but it was a gamble for the sake of everyone in the empire. Extremely frightened, he was able to tell our hero that the original owner of Danda's teeth was still alive. Suddenly, the hero began to return to his humanoid form. The knight continued to speak, explaining that he was aware of why he had traveled so far to pick up this unique weapon. They are ready to give him any help he needs. The next second, our hero said in his threatening voice that he didn't need anything. Maybe he took Danda's teeth just out of boredom and the real purpose was to exterminate humans. And he came very close to this knight. What will this young knight do in such a case? Our protagonist approached him, barely touching his nose. This made the warrior break out in a cold sweat. The whole troop watched this incredible scene in silence. The warriors were ready to rush into battle, their hands already resting on the hilt of their weapons. This monster and their squad leader seemed to have made a deal with each other and each was willing to avoid unnecessary casualties. If this monster is going to ruin everything, why not try what they're offering him? Again with his sinister voice, our protagonist asked this knight if he knew where the owner of Danda's teeth was. The young knight gave an order to his subordinates, and they brought here the girl our hero had met earlier in the auction house. He was a warrior hero. She had a very painful look on her face and in a soft voice she said that she wanted to find out where the owner of this item was, but she needed to see the item first. Our hero warned her not to do anything foolish, or else the absence of her hand would appear like flowers, whereupon he pulled out this weapon from under his cloak. The girl examined the item and felt the dominance of only one person here, who was the owner of this weapon. 
It was as if a map had appeared around her, showing where that person would be. The distance was too great to determine the exact location, but she knew that this person was to the west of the Imperial Palace. This information was enough for our hero, and he understood in which direction to continue his search. He was now sure that Rene was still alive. He let out a deep breath of relief, and the look on his face made it clear to everyone around him that her information had worked on him. Whereupon, to the great joy of all present, he said that he would now take credit for it, and that he would remember these two who had helped him. He began to walk away from the team. After a while, our protagonist reached the center of the teleport, where the demon queen was still guarding the place, destroying one team of warriors after another. Her face was drenched in blood and she was very tired, but she still kept her promise and protected this teleport with all her might. When she saw our hero, she fainted and her weapons fell from her hands. Our hero picked up her body in time and said that her help was enough to repay him. He praised her and told her she was doing a great job and continued to wrap his black tentacles around her body to make her comfortable. Of course, our protagonist didn't know how to use this teleportation device, but he knew that he had to press this button right here and enter his mana to trigger this device. Inside this glass vessel, a green ball of energy began to spin at high speed, but in the next second, there was a shattering of glass and a powerful explosion, scattering the remains of this device all over the room. Unfortunately for our hero, this device was completely destroyed, it couldn't withstand his mana. Though, as he had suggested earlier, the bracelet had already completely stabilized his transformation. He turned his attention to his armband, which was supposed to contain his magic, but it didn't help with this teleportation center. Well, now there was only one thing left for him to do turn back into a giant monster. However, he remembered the words of the skeleton warrior who had warned him not to do that. Our hero thought that he had already done many things, so he failed completely. Now he had no choice. In the next second, he dropped the bracelet from his hand and began to transform into a huge sinister monster. In an instant, this building was completely destroyed by his enormous size, and huge chunks of concrete and stone were scattered far and wide in the surrounding area. The coordinates of where to go next were clear to him. It was Haston City, Wing Mage Tower. At the same time, someone approached near the Wing Mage Tower. This guest was greeted cheerfully by one of the guards. It was Renee, the girl who had come to this tower earlier to sell her weapons. Unfortunately, she couldn't use her magic to get to the top floor because the tower was sealed by a special magical barrier. Much to the guard's surprise, she revealed her sharp swords the next second, and his fate was sealed. When she first came here, she thought the tower looked like a dungeon. In fact, the mage tower is the same dungeon, only with people inside. As she went floor by floor, she methodically and gradually eliminated all the bodyguards. It was like a dungeon to her, and all those people were weak monsters. She dealt with everyone from the first floor up. There was only one person left, and she went up the steep winding stairs. The top floor of the tower, her main goal. She was greeted by the mistress of this tower with an undisguised smile. She heard someone coming, but had no idea who her enemy would be, even though she had carefully prepared herself for this intruder's visit. It turned out to be the same girl who came a few days ago. Well, it turns out you're not human, she declared to the little person standing in front of her in her gorgeous outfit. The girl wasn't interested in talking, so she got right to the point and asked where Danda's teeth were. The woman replied that it was her business now, and she did not have to answer. By the way, she was also interested in learning something. In a mocking tone and with a disparaging smile, she asked the girl why she was still alive. The beautiful green-eyed homunculus revealed her sharp and long daggers again. The girl prepared herself for another attack. With a sneer in her voice, the head of the mage guild said that such a cute girl was not suitable for this kind of weapon. She then activated a special magic shield. Is she really going to attack the head of the guild with some measly knives? As soon as she finished speaking, a tremendous blow shattered the shield. The woman's eyes widened in surprise for with just one powerful blow, her massive magical defense had been destroyed. 
At that moment, she finally realized that this was a monster with incredible strength. However, this woman's tower was built directly above the mana source, so she thought she would be able to defeat the girl by taking advantage of the flow. The young lady, screaming loudly, did not stop delivering her blows one after the other. She wondered where Danda's teeth were. The mage deflected all of her attacks with ease. With a snide smile, she explained that this weapon had not been here for a long time and that she would auction it off. One by one, she used her spells against the girl. Still smiling mockingly, she said that the girl was indeed very strong, so she shouldn't hold back and use her best weapon. And in the next second, a large number of huge magic spears flew in the direction of our heroine, mixed with the rest of the magic spells. It was a powerful attack. Renee used all her strength to dodge the weapon. The attack was so powerful that there was a massive explosion on the top floor of the tower. Unfortunately, when the smoke and dust cleared, we saw that the huge spears were still protruding from Renee's body. It was a high-level magic that even most dungeon bosses couldn't resist. However, as soon as the woman finished speaking, an intense pain engulfed her entire body in the next second. Both of her hands were ripped off. She fell to the ground and screamed in pain, regretting that she had lost her hands. All the wounded Renée came over to her and told her that she had only cut off her brushes, so she shouldn't make such a fuss over little things. The young girl stomped her foot on her body preparing to deliver another final blow. Much to the dismay and disappointment of the woman, who screamed that she wanted to live and survive. Now that the guild leader seemed to be defeated, the girl didn't know what to do next. She stepped aside and stood against the wall to rest and catch her breath. She was very tired and worn out. She was ready to fall asleep right here and now. However, in the next second, a very loud voice sounded and someone drew her attention away. One of her subordinates came running to the woman, trying to bring his boss to his senses and help her somehow. The woman angrily asked for his help, but at the same time told the young man to kill the girl. The young man urged her to calm down, as she had lost too much blood and needed to conserve her strength. Then he showed her a huge crystal that could save her. In a normal situation, this woman would have easily recognized the trap in the crystal. However, since she was weak now, she didn't notice anything suspicious. The young man told her that it was a high-grade magic stone that would allow her to escape. But he didn't have enough mana to activate it, so he needed her help. However, Rene could easily see that this stone contained the same thing that she herself had once received from this woman. She will never forget that terrible energy that almost destroyed her boss and herself. The young man touched his crystal to the woman's forehead, who thought she could live now. But in the next second, her eyes lit up with a strange red light, for in that moment, to the young man's delight, that terrible spirit that had been trapped in that crystal broke out. This monster took over the woman's body, which began to transform into a huge creature. While this was happening, the young man told her that she had made too many enemies. Why else would this young girl come here? He was able to open up to her completely and said that even her family had ordered her to be eliminated if he noticed anything suspicious in her behavior. That's why he's here. He turned to René, who was watching with interest from the sidelines. He bowed to the girl and thanked her for the work she had done for him. But now, if he continues to mind his own business, this girl might come after him as well. Therefore, the energy that will be released when this woman turns into a monster will allow him to get away from here for a while. It will be a kind of insurance for him. Literally in the next second, a huge-looking scary monster with big lips and red eyes appeared in front of Renée's face. Unfortunately, the girl's right eye was completely blind, and the opponent in front of her was not one that could be easily defeated with a wounded body and without proper weapons. However, she had no choice but to attack because this pathetic, ugly creature didn't like her. She was ready to pay with her life for all the sins she had committed against her boss. And while she was saying this and preparing for her final attack, the young girl was completely unaware that her boss, our protagonist, was already in the building and ready to rescue his charge. She gritted her teeth and let out a horrified scream so that this disgusting creature would not dare to interrupt her master's scent. Then she rushed to the attack, 
still shouting that if she was going to die, it should be with this monster. No sooner had she thrust her weapon into one of the monster's eyes than she was thrown aside in the next second by a powerful tentacle strike. Realizing that her end was near, her last thought was whether her master would be sad to see her die. However, in the next instant, the tremendous black energy and enormous size of our protagonist completely destroyed this tower with a powerful explosion. To the girl's surprise, she heard a familiar voice asking if she was okay. The stones of the collapsed building were still flying past her, and she realized that he had saved her again, just like the first time. That last time, when her body and mind were devastated, and she saw no reason to live, he had appeared before her. And now he had saved her again, holding her in his arms, protecting her from the ruins of this building. The girl couldn't believe her eyes that her master was the dungeon master in front of her. He lowered her to the ground very carefully and gently, then sat down next to her for a moment. She still didn't understand why he was here and thought that maybe it was her hallucination. Our hero replied that he had something important to finish. He then turned his attention to this terrifying, ugly monster of enormous size standing right in front of him. His eyes were filled with fury and anger. He told the monster that it was a bold move on his part, but he didn't realize who he was risking to touch. And in the next second, he began to unleash his powerful blows one after the other. His mighty fists ripped through the creature and tore it to pieces. The blue liquid flew around. Huge black spikes pierced the ugly creature from all sides, and it began to make sounds of impending death. Our hero was disgusted by what he saw in front of his eyes. Again and again, he threw the creature to the stone floor with tremendous force. Huge cobblestones flew apart after his blows. He reached out his hand to pick up a piece of the monster and examine it more closely. What an abomination, our hero thought, and in the next second, he threw the monster back against the rocks with great force. There was so much of that blue liquid that it poured all around, and our hero finally realized that instead of blood, this creature had mana, which allowed it to be reborn over and over again. Not even a second later, that ugly creature that made terrible, incomprehensible noises reappeared in front of him. Finally, our hero realized that this particular orb underground is the source of life for this monster. Happily, he realized that it would be much easier to defeat it now, whereupon he became so huge that this monster seemed like a small fly on the ground. With immense strength, he unleashed an unbelievably powerful strike that completely destroyed the underground mana source and the monster. He turned back to René, who had been sitting on the ground all this time, not daring to look at him. She was still crying and he tried to comfort her. There was so much he wanted to say to her, but he had forgotten everything, so they sat in silence for a while. In a short retelling, he told her how he had traveled to her and who he had fought on the way, then he turned to her again. He apologized to her for what had happened to them a few days ago. The girl replied that he should not apologize, as she did not deserve to see her master. Our hero convinced her that this dungeon needs a gatekeeper like her. It needs her, it needs her badly. After a while, the girl came to her senses and asked him if he was angry with her. He answered immediately, without hesitation, that he did not. Could it be that he hated her after all that had happened? Our hero immediately replied that no, it's okay. Then he stood up and said he had a surprise for her. He pulled out her weapon and said here it is, she left it somewhere, so he brought it back. She couldn't believe her eyes and started sobbing even more. Happy now. The tears started to fall on the smooth metal of her blade. She was so scared, she was afraid that he would hate her now, he would leave her, and she would never be able to go back to the dungeon to him. Our hero replied with a smile that this would never happen. He gave her his hand and told her that they would go back home together. We go back a while to when Renee first appeared in this dungeon. Still yawning, our hero explains to Skeleton that she is a homunculus and that he met her when he was dealing with the burning of the forest. He saw her in the lab. According to our hero, it was fate, so he decided to take her with him. The skeleton looked down at her and realized that all the research on homunculi was embedded in this little creature. To Skeleton's surprise, this girl could be in that room that was overflowing with evil energy. 
This room was also known as the Demon Sanctuary. The strongest room of the strongest boss. So, she has enough physical and mental capacity to handle the incredible pressure of energy that was generated in this room. They still didn't know what to do with her, and according to our hero, he would want her to live with them. If she is able, they will teach her how to fight. But if it doesn't work out, then let her live her life as she wants. Besides, the girl had experience as a maid, so our hero offered to make her a cook. Skeleton's head was already buzzing with his boss's ideas. Is he really serious? And who's going to train her? He asked. In our hero's opinion, it was he, Skeleton, who should have been in charge of her training. And there's no need to deny it. He, on the other hand, was bored with having nothing to do. So now he was going to teach this girl various skills. The skeleton looked at her hopefully. Since she had excellent physical abilities, she probably still retained her hatred for the people who had treated her so harshly. He was curious about her name. At this time, our hero, who was lying on his side and scratching his belly, was trying to remember her real name. Doesn't she know how to speak? The girl began to utter a few words softly. The skeleton asked her, Is that really your full name? He said that he's the one who runs this place, so he's going to name her personally. After thinking for a long time, our protagonist seemed to remember her name. I think it was Renee, he said. After that, the giant monster fell asleep again, which did not surprise Skeleton. Now the warrior was left alone with the girl, so he had to take care of her training. But first, he's going to teach her to smile. We're back in the present where Skeleton asks his boss why he's so happy. What had he done in this city to make the earth tremble even in this dungeon? Did he really dance like a madman in the middle of the city? Justifying himself, our protagonist replied that there were always exceptions in the life of monsters. Unfortunately, he was missing an eye. The skeleton turned his attention to the girl sleeping sweetly in our hero's arms. Is this also an exception? He asked his boss. Our hero apologized again and explained that it was a long story. The skeleton couldn't believe that the boss could take such a little girl out of the city. But he replied, Does he look like someone who could do such a thing? It's not a girl at all. The skeleton didn't realize what was happening. Where is the Renee he was supposed to bring back? And why did he bring the child here? Our protagonist was so embarrassed that he turned into a black puddle the next second. He said he met Renee in the human village. This made the skeleton gasp in surprise. He asked if she was injured. His boss replied that she was exhausted. Perhaps she'd been restrained all along. However, the skeleton was adamant in his strictness, so he said there was no need to make an unnecessary drama. And let him tell me straight out that it didn't work. After saying these words, the big monster blushed red like a little child. He joked about the skeleton and said that he would now wear a maid's costume and run the dungeon. The next second, deep in his bones, the warrior pulled out his resignation letter and said it was ready. Of course, it was a joke on his part. He just wanted to know what to do next. The boss replied that they would wait again. Maybe she'll come back. Skeleton said he understood as he took a deep breath. It seems that when his boss is in that state, it's best to leave him alone. Yes, now our hero is sad and tough, but a little time will pass and he will feel better. However, the very next second, they heard someone coming their way. Did she really come back? Yes, yes, it was her, Renee, the one they had been waiting for so long. The first thing she did was to ask her master if he had eaten, and if not, she was ready to make dinner. It was then that Skeleton realized why her right eye was yellow, and why his boss was missing an eye. Had the boss shared his right eye with her? I think that's what happened. A little earlier, our protagonist noticed that her right eye had gotten pretty bad. If she could see well, she would probably be able to see the stone where the evil spirit was trapped. She cried bitterly, holding her darkened, tarnished eye with her right hand. Our hero told her that if she still had the feelings she told him earlier, if she still loved him, he would ask her to bring him a real love stone next time. Then he took out his eye and put it into the fragile little body. For the first time in a long time, Renée smiled broadly 
and loudly proclaimed that she was now truly at her master's side. In that dim dungeon, a drop of water fell on the demon queen's forehead, waking her instantly. She still didn't know where she was or what had happened to her. The next second, she jerked slightly in surprise as a skeleton warrior stood in front of her, sharpening his weapon and watching her closely. The girl was frightened and thought that she must have already died and was in hell, and in front of her was the guardian of the other world. But the skeleton just laughed and said that she was in the most powerful dungeon. These words surprised her, and she immediately realized that she was in the strongest dungeon, and before her was a very famous skeleton warrior. He noticed that she was a quick thinker. He then turned to his boss and slapped him hard on the side to wake him up. Still yawning loudly, he complained that the skeleton had woken him up for nothing. The next second, he noticed that the demon queen was already awake. Cold sweat ran down her back and her eyes widened in surprise. The next second, she fell to her knees and began to pompously recite the full name of this giant monster that was known to every human. After a while, when her initial fear had passed, she decided to introduce herself with a tremor in her voice. She gave him her full name and told him that she was a seventeenth-generation demon queen. What a powerful performance, our hero thought, looking up at her in surprise. Yes, he knows her name. The girl was again surprised that he knew her full name. Had this huge monster been told her full name by the same young man she had met earlier in the city? After a moment of confusion, she tried to locate that young man somewhere near her. She remembered exactly how he took Danda's teeth and went to punish people. In a low voice, our hero said that this young man was him. At that time, the skeleton watched silently. The girl's eyes widened again in surprise. Had she really heard something incredible again? Leaning on his arm as a huge beast, our hero looked up at her and said that this young man was him. A second later, the girl was again overcome by an incredible fear, and a cold sweat ran down her back. Very emotionally, she began to replay in her mind all the events that had taken place with him earlier in the city. Had she really behaved so lewdly in front of this hero? And while the girl was still in that state, the skeleton turned to the boss and asked him what she said about humans. How does it make sense that he said he would go out to punish people? Perhaps the boss will deign to explain what that means. Our protagonist began to blush with shame again, like a little child who has broken a jam jar. We are transported to a night and dark forest, not far from the entrance to a dungeon, where a young man was searching for something, lighting his way with an oil lamp. The young men did not listen to their older friends and went into this forest in search of herbs and mushrooms. They had been told not to come here, but nothing had happened yet, even though this forest was full of danger. The next second, there was a noise behind the young man's back. He came closer and saw the bloody body of a badly wounded warrior lying on the grass. He wanted to help him. He placed his lantern on the ground and prepared to get the healing herbs. But as soon as he stretched out his hand, the warrior lunged at him with a terrifying scream. In an instant, the wizard was in the young man's cloak. Now he had to get to the city. A dungeon is a battleground, and there are certain principles you must follow to survive. One of them is to keep stress to a minimum. Meanwhile, Renée tried to calm her new friend, who she thought was making too much noise for this dungeon. The demon queen refused, saying that she was a free monster and would do as she pleased. The two girls continued to argue vehemently about who was more right, and it seemed that a conflict between them was already inevitable. And while Mr. Swallow slept soundly, the demon queen was able to cuddle up to him and give him her warmth. In her opinion, Renée is too strict in this regard, and in general, she acts like a grandmother. A wave of anger and rage swept over the silver-haired girl. Waving her weapon, she chased after the demon queen, who kept laughing loudly as she tried to run away from her. Renée desperately wanted to catch up with the demon queen and teach her a lesson in manners. Gritting his teeth, the skeleton watched everything that happened. Minimal stress. This principle was almost in use now. Our hero complained to his friend that the girls were too noisy and he couldn't sleep. To which the skeleton replied that it was not appropriate to be outraged right now, 
because now there was unrest outside because of his actions. The monster wanted to know if it was really that serious. The skeleton replied that yes, it was serious, and it was being actively reported in the newspapers he had let him read earlier. It said that a large number of warriors had been drawn to the capital of the empire to strengthen its defenses. In addition, the villages on the outskirts of the city had become empty because of the monsters. The chief of the village next to the dungeon committed suicide. As a result, the village is now in dire straits. Skeleton said that in three weeks of searching, out of all the human newspapers he found, there were only three articles mentioning the neighboring village. He was curious to know what his master thought. But he didn't seem to understand what it meant. After saying that, the skeleton got angry and told him to think before answering. Maybe he should really quit now. Still yawning, the giant monster tried to get the skeleton's opinion on the situation. But the skeleton replied that he did not know because there was too little information and it was too early to draw any conclusions. So far, only one thing is clear. This village has been cut off from the outside world. All because his master, that giant monster, destroyed the village. Doesn't he remember how many things he destroyed? According to the skeleton, not receiving news from the destroyed village was a real problem for them. By observing this village, they could tell when and how big the next group of invaders would be. With an anxious voice and bright lights in the place of his former eyes, the skeleton explained that it was necessary to go there as soon as possible. If they delayed even a little longer, who knows what might happen? Our hero wished him a safe journey. He began to breathe deeply with excitement and really wished that the skeleton would go alone, without him. To the surprise of our hero, the skeleton said that he would try to return as soon as possible. Having said that, he began to walk away. Happily, our hero began tapping his tail on the ground in anticipation of the coming dream. Now he was alone and could sleep. But in the next second, the skeleton turned around and said that it wasn't very wise to go alone. So it would be great if someone else went with him. As if not understanding who the skeleton was talking about, our monster looked at the fighting girls. Demon Queen, candidate number one. She's dangerous enough, literally a walking bomb. If she uses the same spell as the village capital next door, no stone will be left unturned. Rene smiled and offered to be the skeleton's assistant. That was candidate number two. The monster became even more worried and anxious as he imagined how much trouble this girl could bring to the city. She was even more dangerous than the demon queen, so she better not go anywhere and stay here. Our hero's thoughts were interrupted by a skeleton who offered to go with him. The monster realized that he was already caught in its net. Now there was no escape and no way out. At that moment, our hero had an incredible epiphany. Coincidentally, he destroyed the bracelet the skeleton had given him last time, so now he couldn't use his transformation. The bone warrior agreed that he could not go with him without the bracelet. However, our hero rejoiced early, thinking that he was now free and could finally get some sleep. The very next second, he assumed humanoid form. With sadness in his voice, he said that the skeleton's death would be painful. They were already walking through the forest, the bone warrior paying no attention to his words. He jokingly said that his body was already dead, so he was not afraid of any punishment. As it turned out, the skeleton had a spare bracelet, so it was no use the boss saying he couldn't leave without it. Didn't his master mean that if the bracelet had been there, he would have gone with it? With a slight irritation in his voice, our hero answered in the negative, whereupon they quickened their pace to get out of the forest faster. After a while, they reached the first watchtower, which was completely destroyed. In the skeleton's opinion, his boss had made a real mess of things. They went inside, and the skeleton explained that there were four simple ways to determine how active a village was. The first was the liveliness of the market. Of course, no one was here and our hero begged his friend to hurry home. The second method is how much smoke comes out of the chimneys of the houses. But it's worth checking before dinner, it's too late now. The monster asked him to return to the dungeon. The third method is to see how many mercenaries and troops are in the errand center, but it has nothing to do with this village, so they need to move on. Already very sleepy, our hero refused to walk, 
and the skeleton had to pull his boss along the ground. Finally, the fourth method is inns and taverns. But as soon as the skeleton spoke, his master was gone. And while the skeleton froze in place, our hero ran excitedly to the tavern he knew. As the front door swung open, the young man turned to the owner and asked for a few free seats. Of course, the place was empty. In a very worried voice, the skeleton said, Things are really very bad. This village might be abandoned soon. In the next moment, we realize the reason for the absence of people in this village. It turns out that a terrible black curse has befallen the inhabitants of this settlement and other places in the area. And the reason for all this was a new character in our story. He put a lot of effort into making it all happen. He was happily looking at the results of his work while standing on a huge pile of corpses. Because of the black catastrophe, the people are weaker than ever. He was able to conquer this village, the heart of his enemy. Now it was the turn of the empire's capital. This is the best time to destroy it. Now our heroes entered the inn, which was also empty. This is very serious, the skeleton's voice said, again with concern. Apparently, all the villagers had left the place. But in the next second, someone's voice sounded behind them. Our heroes turned in his direction. Standing at the top of the stairs, the man asked them who they were and why they were here. He introduced himself as the owner of the place. There was fear and caution in his voice. Behind his back, with a trembling hand, he held an axe. The skeleton tried to defuse the situation by introducing himself as a knight of a punitive force from another city. The innkeeper breathed a sigh of relief and put down his weapon. He thought our heroes were bandits. It turned out that they were guests who wanted to spend the night and eat something. To the owner's delight, he apologized for his behavior and agreed to serve them. He started down the stairs and said that unfortunately he didn't have any food, and they might not be able to find it in the whole village. The skeleton suggested that it was all because of the black catastrophe, to which the man replied with a deep breath that they understood him now, and that it was indeed very hard to live in this village. By this time, our hero was already asleep at the table. The man said honestly and openly that there were no rooms available at the moment. This signal was clear to the Knight of Bones, who realized that in such a situation, even the price of water would be more expensive than a night's lodging. The next second, he threw a large gold coin at the man, much to the surprise of the owner of this place. Now he could surely find a ready room for them to sleep in. This large amount of money seemed to work, and now the man suggested that they go upstairs. He looked closely at the strange young man in tattered clothes who was following the knight. The skeleton reassured the man and explained that the young man was his slave. Our hero tried to say something, but the skeleton interrupted him. The bones man replied that the young man was his slave and that he helped him a lot, so he was treated accordingly. And his slave has to sleep in the same room with him. By the way, maybe the man can tell them where the bedroom is. They then entered the spacious room to the delight of our hero, who declared that it was not so bad here. It seemed that the place was ready to receive guests, after all. The next second, the young man fell happily onto the bed, hugging the soft pillows. This bed was much better than the one he had in the other city. The skeleton wanted to hide something in one of the closets in the room. Our hero was curious why he called him his slave. The knight in shining armor replied that although his boss wore comfortable clothes, they were too shabby and made him look more like a beggar so addressing him like that was the best option in this situation. You never know how people will react to a commoner, but when he is with the master, no one will touch him so easily. Didn't his boss think it was a wise decision since he hadn't even bothered to change his clothes? Especially since the boss would like to move less and rest more. The young man replied that he would surely become a stone in the next life. Skeleton closed the closet drawer and said he would go out for a while to survey the area. The boss needs to rest. As he fell asleep, the young man advised his friend not to be so overwhelmed on his first day. The skeleton replied that his boss did not have to worry about him, because there were places where he could move freely at night, whereupon he jumped out of the window. After the black catastrophe struck this city, the imperial family expressed their anger over the attack. 
and someone had to take responsibility for the failed attempts to conquer the powerful dungeon where our heroes lived. The skeleton climbed to the highest roof in the city. In front of him he found a huge crater. Leaving such a hole in the center of the city was not the best idea of our hero. The skeleton was very curious to know who was running the place. He opened his journal and began to scrutinize the list of influential people in the city. Obviously, the emperor's wrath would be directed at the new ruling family of this place. However, it is not known if the successors of the count who committed suicide inherited the new title. So Skeleton decided that he should go and see this new count. The next second, he jumped down silently, straight to the entrance of the count's castle. The guards were stronger than he had thought. That was a problem. Sure, he could have easily killed or stunned those guards, but when the sun rises, a fuss will be made. He decided to take his time and go somewhere else to investigate. One of the rooms in this house caught his eye, and the next second he jumped through the open window. There was a strong smell of corpses coming from the place, if you could call it a smell. He decided to take a closer look at the place. Meanwhile, in his room, our hero thought that it would be much better to sleep in a cool dungeon, but it wasn't bad here either. The next moment, however, someone knocked hard on his door. Will he never get to sleep in peace? It was the voice of the innkeeper, who wanted to talk to the knight for some reason. The young man opened the door and said that his master was out for a night walk. It turned out that the man wanted to offer them dinner. He had prepared a simple meal for them. As an innkeeper, he couldn't let his guests go hungry. Besides, the knight had thanked him generously, so he wanted to return the favor. They walked slowly through the corridors of the abandoned building, talking about current events in the village. The man told him that many villagers had fainted after seeing the black catastrophe with their own eyes. He was referring to our hero. Then he paused and added that the Count had committed suicide after all that had happened. Then any movement in that place was forbidden, and now the corpses of people who had died of hunger lay behind the wall. The innkeeper did not understand why they had come here. He advised them to leave as soon as possible, for he himself was about to leave this village. In his opinion, they should be careful. The few people left in this village are quite aggressive. That's because they're cornered. Meanwhile, someone snuck into our protagonist's room. It was a girl with red hair and bare feet. After making sure that no one was in the room, the girl quickly jumped into it. She expected to find something of value and maybe some food. She thought that this man must be from out of town if he decided to stay here, especially since the village was in such a sad state. Besides, this was the most expensive room in the entire hotel. Therefore, in the girl's opinion, it was likely that this man was very rich. She wanted to take anything of value. Her eyes fell on our hero's cape. She was surprised to find that this garment smelled like a rag. Nevertheless, she decided to take our hero's clothes to wrap other valuables she found. Much to her dismay, she couldn't find anything of value wherever she looked. However, in the next second, she decided to open one of the drawers of the dresser that was next to the bed. Finally, she was able to find something very interesting. After all, this guest can't be carrying around her valuables. Her eyes widened even more in surprise as she saw a very strange object. After a while, our two heroes were back in the room. One of them had just woken up, still yawning as usual, and the other, a skeleton, had come in through the window, wondering what his boss was up to while he went to check out the castle of the ruler of this place. He took off his helmet and told his boss that the guards were stronger than he expected, so he decided to return today without any results. Maybe the boss could find out something useful while he was away. Our hero replied that after talking to the innkeeper, all he knew was that the village had no contact with the outside world. At this, the skeleton was pleasantly surprised, because for the first time in a long time, his master was doing something useful. The knight confirmed his words and offered to find out more about the place in the morning, but the young man was determined to stay in bed. The next second, the skeleton turned his attention to the two open windows. In the bone knight's opinion, it would be better to keep the windows closed, since he had only opened one, and now that both were open, they might as well be robbed. 
The young man replied that he didn't know what he was talking about because he hadn't opened the window. Skeleton laughed and thought that maybe the boss was joking, because windows can't open by themselves. Was it a ghost? Could be a sign, could be a thief. Only now did the skeleton warrior turn his attention to the open shelf in the dresser, and fear gripped his entire bony body. In the next second, our protagonist realized that his cloak was gone. This cape was very precious to him, because René had made it for him. The skeleton continued to rummage through the empty box, but could not find anything. Maybe the boss had seen what he had put in the chest of drawers. The young man turned to the skeleton and asked what had been stolen. The bone warrior hesitated for a moment, then sheepishly replied that the robbers had taken his ribs. All the while, the thief girl was running away from the inn. She was sweating profusely and stopped to look back. Someone might be chasing her, but there was no one. However, in the next second, the girl's path was blocked by a group of men. One of them called her by name and asked her in a stern voice where she had gone in the middle of the night. After all, this man had earlier told her not to go out after dark, but she had disobeyed him. Barely out of breath, the girl replied that she was out for a reason. But the man interrupted her and didn't let her finish. In a rage, he began to shout at her that she was wasting her energy, which made her even more hungry. However, the girl still begged him to listen to her and let her speak. She was approached by another man who suggested not to pressure the girl and to let her say what she wanted to say. It was the leader of the gang of thieves who explained that the man was not angry at all because she had gone out alone in the dark. According to him, the girl's mistake was that she left without telling anyone. She completely ignores the dire situation she's in and does whatever she wants. Therefore, one should think about the harm it might cause to others before acting. After being scolded by the leader of this gang, she agreed to be more careful. The man said he hoped she understood now, so he was curious to see what she was holding on her shoulder. The next second, something fell to the ground with a crunch. She told the gang leader that she really wanted to contribute to the common cause, so she stole all these things. The man looked at the items on the floor suspiciously, not knowing where she could have gotten them. The girl exclaimed that she had stolen them from an inn on the main road. Justifying herself, she replied that there was a very nice room in this hotel, and this thing was in the dresser, and very clean, maybe it was an expensive relic. The gang leader thought for a second and paused before answering. They were human ribs, and he told the girl so. When he said this, she became upset and said that she was completely unaware of this and would never take such a thing. Did she dare desecrate someone's grave? One of the thieves was interested, but according to the leader of this gang, if that were the case, she wouldn't be bragging about her item in front of them right now. He picked up the ribs to examine them more closely. He realized that either someone had an unusual hobby, or these ribs were used for magic. One of the thieves was disgusted by the object. In his opinion, the world was full of strange people who used the amputated limbs of their slaves as decoration. At first glance, however, it was not at all clear whether these were the bones of a human or someone who had once been one. If they belonged to a necromancer or someone who studied black magic, the situation became even more dangerous. Because now those ribs could pose a serious threat to the lives of the entire gang. It all looks too suspicious. The clothes look like a common beggar's rags. However, this cape is made of high-quality materials. The gang leader reproached the girl for being very absent-minded and not even checking her pockets, because there was something jingling in them. The next second, the whole gang opened their mouths in surprise when they saw a huge amount of gold coins. But the gang leader did not share their enthusiasm and said that now was not the time to rejoice. He realized that they might be in serious trouble. And in the next second, someone's voice said that they were quite hard to find, but that they were trying their best. Skeleton said that they came to the right place and found this gang of thieves who took their stuff. Now the gang leader realized that he had to be more careful because the guest staying in the most expensive hotel room in the ruined village was suspicious. He gradually turned towards our heroes, hearing their voices and approaching footsteps. As our heroes slowly approached this gang, the man heard someone's voice saying that the valuables were fine. 
In his mind, he replayed everything that had happened. Human ribs, clothes made of high-quality materials, and a lot of gold. It's very dangerous. They touched something they shouldn't have. It was our heroes who greeted the thieves and told them they were here for their belongings. Our heroes were very happy to find this band of thieves. It seemed that their belongings were undamaged. Now the skeleton could see that it was the same cape that Rene had given to the boss. And if the dungeon master were to break this girl's heart again, the Knight of Bones couldn't even imagine what terrible things might happen after that. What a relief to find what they were looking for. But the gang leader obviously had some kind of plan. He stepped forward, holding the object our heroes needed. They realized that he was in charge here, but the man was curious how they had found them so quickly. The skeleton replied that perhaps the object itself wanted to find its owner. All the while, our main character never stopped complaining that he was very tired and really wanted to go back to bed. This time, the skeleton warrior is going to complain about all the bosses whining, because he's had a really hard day. The skeleton then turns to the gang leader and tells him that he picked the wrong things to steal. Maybe he'll give it all back to them. It was a very tense situation, but the gang leader refused to give up. He began to negotiate with our heroes, wanting to know where the guarantee was that they would leave after their belongings were returned to them. The skeleton thought for a while before answering. The gang leader still didn't understand how they had been found out. Even if the girl had left footprints, they had been found too quickly, considering that it was night. And in his opinion, as an experienced person, only some monsters were capable of such a thing. Were they really the ones standing in front of him? It seemed to be true black magic. And those ribs were incredibly strong. The man turned back to the skeleton and asked if they really lived in darkness. The bone warrior replied that yes, the cave was indeed dark. Of course, it was a provocative question, and with such an answer, the gang leader understood everything immediately. He now knew for sure that he was dealing with black magic. Still talking to the bone warrior, he gently took the girl's ribs with his hand. The knight replied that these ribs were very important to him because they were his body. A sarcastic smile appeared on the man's face. It seemed that an interesting plan was born in his mind. The next second he threw those ribs high into the air with all his might. This trick was meant for our knight, and while he was distracted, the gang leader ordered his subordinates to first rescue those who could not move on their own. The skeleton jumped out of his seat and rushed to catch his ribs so they wouldn't hit the rocks. He fell to the ground and began to slide forward, his arms outstretched to catch the object he cherished but as soon as he was happy to have his ribs in his hands, someone hit his head with a rock. The blow was so strong that the stone broke on the helmet of our skeleton. The knight did not flinch, however, and this news caused the man great consternation. Still yawning, our protagonist watched from the sidelines. However, the very next second, someone with a huge knife sneaked up behind him. The man tried to plunge his weapon into our hero's back but it shattered into small pieces and did no harm. The next thing he knew, our hero was holding his attacker by the neck and lifting him high off the ground. He turned to the skeleton, wondering what they should do in this situation. The knight turned to our hero and said that he had lost all patience and suggested that his boss stop all these games. These people needed to be dealt with once and for all. The offender of our knight tried to run away, but the skeleton quickly grabbed his hand. The next second, he threw his attacker to the ground with tremendous force. Now our heroes fought the humans in their territory. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, two girls were sitting at a table peacefully drinking tea. Rene was very curious to know how our dungeon master was doing. She was very concerned that it had been half a day since he had gone away. The demon queen remarked to herself that time really does pass more slowly in this dungeon than it does on earth. The silver-haired girl was very worried about her master. Something might have happened to him, but here she is just sitting back and enjoying her vacation. Or maybe the master wants to eat and is very hungry. All the while, the demon queen tried to calm her down, for it was impossible for a great creature to miss a meal. She was beginning to lose patience as Renée kept harping on the same subject. But the girl was still very worried, 
because maybe her master and his friend had gotten into trouble in this human village. The demon queen realized that calming her friend was useless, so she began to tease her a bit. Meanwhile, back in the night city, the skeleton noted that these people had been a bit of a nuisance to deal with, while our protagonist was very happy to be holding his cape again. The Knight of Bones was very surprised that the man was able to distract him, if only for a moment. He thought these men would have a map of the settlement, being thieves, but they didn't. They needed to clean up the place quickly and not waste any more time. They should have left sooner. The skeleton was very annoyed that his boss had been lying on the ground all this time. The young man showed no alarm and offered his friend to lie down next to him in this comfortable spot. However, in the next instant, the very girl who had stolen their belongings appeared in front of them. With a trembling voice and great fear, she begged for forgiveness. She fell to her knees and began to beg them to kill only her and not the others who had nothing to do with it. The next second, the gang leader lifted the girl off the ground with a scream and said that they had to get out of here quickly because these two wouldn't just leave her alone. Our hero said with a smile that something was finally getting through to these people. He motioned for his friend to deal, and the skeleton warrior walked forward with a confident stride. The young girl and the gang leader looked worriedly in his direction. The man covered the girl with his hand and said that if this skeleton came any closer, he would kill him. The next second, the girl was praying, holding a very interesting object in her hands. And as she recited her prayer, the object began to emit manna. This did not go unnoticed by the skeleton who watched the girl and the object in her hands in amazement. In the next second, he rushed forward and got as close to her as possible, pushing the man with the knife aside. He was very curious to know where she got the item from. The girl froze in fear as the skeleton leaned forward to examine the object. It was a cross in the shape of an inverted phoenix, and manna was emanating from it. It was special tracking manna. Skeleton didn't understand why someone would want to spy on poor people. And while he thought about it, the girl on her knees could not answer anything. The very next moment, Skeleton rushed to our boss with great speed and informed him that the villagers were being watched by someone. As the girl began to pray, the mana of the tracker seeped out of the cross. So it's only activated in certain situations. According to the skeleton, if you know the conditions under which this happens, you can find out what the person who gave this cross to the girl is up to. Now our protagonist realized that something strange was happening here, because this village was never known for its magic. Last time it was a magic stone, and now it's some kind of mana cross. It seems that the skeleton has come up with some kind of cunning plan. In order to get people on his side, he asked his boss for help. But the young man didn't understand why or how. The skeleton happily exclaimed that it was actually simpler than that. Then he tapped his helmet and said that a brilliant plan had just been hatched. One of the men helped the wounded gang leader to his feet. Meanwhile, the skeleton apologized to the people, saying that they weren't doing this because they stole their stuff. In fact, he and his friend were following a special imperial order to leave no trace of the fight. What's the imperial order? At his words, the crowd exclaimed in surprise. Skeleton continued to tell his made-up story explaining that they were actually members of a secret organization that reported directly to the emperor himself. He made up a name for a group of knights. The girl and the man looked over, they had never heard such a name before. At that time, there were even more people. The skeleton kept reassuring everyone around them that they weren't in any danger and didn't mean to hurt anyone. The people in the crowd were curious to know what the knights had forgotten in this village. In a loud and confident voice, the skeleton announced that they were here to save this settlement. They had kept all the inhabitants alive by violating a direct order from the emperor because they needed certain information. They had to deal with the situation as quickly as possible and asked the imperial house for material support for this village. While the skeleton was talking, one of the gang leaders, who was still badly wounded, approached him. The knight turned to the crowd and asked them what they thought. Perhaps they would like to help rebuild their village. The knight's team will need their strength. The air was filled with the excited chatter of the crowd, who believed that His Majesty the Emperor had not forgotten them and had sent someone to save their village. 
It seemed that everyone now agreed to help these two knights and finally put an end to their miserable lives. The skeleton returned to our hero and said that he seemed to have succeeded in convincing people because they are so easily manipulated. Few are so tolerant of self-justification because they are lower class. The young man didn't seem to share his optimism and suggested that he return to the inn or the dungeon. But the skeleton replied that this was only the beginning, for he was noticing more and more suspicious things by the minute. Of course, our tired protagonist appreciates his friend's efforts, but in his opinion, there is still more work to be done. Doesn't it bother him at all? The monster then turned on its side and covered its head with its hood. However, the Knight of Bones was not about to give up. Since the situation had come to this, the boss would have to work now, so he had to get up. The young man told his friend that since he was so enthusiastic, he might as well do everything himself without his help. However, the skeleton, who was the leader in this situation, told our hero that he would talk to the head of these people, who still treated them with suspicion. And in Knight's opinion, the young man should try to get closer to people. After hearing these words, our hero's eyes widened in surprise. How can he get closer to people? How? The skeleton jokingly replied that it couldn't be helped, because if you take a knight in armor and a beggar-looking boss, who do you think looks closer to ordinary people? It was clear from the expression on our hero's face that he was not happy to be called a beggar boss. While they were still heatedly discussing what had happened, the crowd in the distance was watching these two strange knights. In the skeleton's opinion, the boss should have just befriended the whole crowd and tried to act like a human being. This seems to have been the hardest thing for our hero to do, because first of all, people sleep most of the day, but even those who are awake still walk around like sleepy people, and secondly, most of the time they are lazy. They never have any desire to do anything, so he also has to go along with his usual behavior, which is just to do nothing and keep resting. However, the skeleton told him that he didn't know what his master was thinking, but it wouldn't be as easy as it looked. The young man also had to remember to find out about the church that had given the girl this cross. We needed to get every drop of information out of these people, and if he could do it early, they'd get home faster and his boss could rest. The skeleton added that the people were very cautious, so he should be more patient. It would not be easy to get close to them. And in a second, the young man was inundated with questions from all sides. Is he really a knight? serving in this unknown legion under the imperial house? Did they come from the capital of the empire? Is it really as good as they say? His friend wore armor, but why was he dressed so plainly? The people continued to inundate him with questions. Someone in the crowd said that it was his disguise, and these knights didn't usually go around dressed like that. Our hero's ears were ringing from all the noise. He held his head and covered his ears with his hands so that he couldn't hear the crowd. If it weren't for the skeleton warrior's guidance, he would have been ready to devour all those people. Still, the young man made an effort to get at least a little closer to these people, and then he turned to the little boy and asked him with a smile what he was interested in learning. The boy, still tugging at our hero's cloak, was curious to know if he had ever met two very famous people, to which the young man replied that he didn't understand who he was talking about, although he seemed to have heard those names before. The next second, the girl came back to our hero and apologized for stealing their stuff earlier. Overcoming his desire to destroy them all, the protagonist explained that there was nothing wrong with that since they had already returned all the items intact. One of the men approached him and said that he was the deputy leader of the gang, and he's willing to help him in any way he can. And since our knights have come to save this village, why doesn't he take a look around himself? It'll be easier if he sees everything with his own eyes. Never before has our hero had to submit to the will of the people, but this time he still had to get up and go look around right now. All the better to go, because if he stayed here, he would be bombarded with questions again. So he got up and walked forward with the man. After a while they started to look around the houses and noticed that all the streets were completely empty and there were no people around. The man told our hero that if he now opened the front door of one of the houses, the young man would immediately understand everything. With a heavy creak, the wooden door opened and our hero saw a horrible scene. 
On the floor lay two people who, according to his companion, had starved to death. According to the man, there's not even any food left to steal in the area, and the survivors don't know when they'll starve to death. Our hero realizes that something very strange and suspicious is going on here. It turns out that these people died from lack of food. That's why the village is deserted. From the very beginning, he had a question to which he could not find an answer. After all, when there is not enough food in the settlements, the villagers go to the village leader in anger, with pitchforks in hand. In times of famine, angry mobs take up arms. But why are the people of this village dying so mercilessly for lack of food? Looking off into the distance, the man quietly said that it had been about a month since the black catastrophe had struck this place. Turning to our hero, he asked the knight if he would like to know why the village was so quiet and why the people had not taken up hoes and pitchforks to assert their rights. Meanwhile, in the dungeon, the girls were still sitting at the table drinking tea. The demon queen was very bored here and would like to go to the village with her master. Renée reassured her that she didn't have to think like that. After all, the owner of this place had entrusted her with the protection of the dungeon, so nothing could be more important than that. According to the girl, this was proof that our hero trusted her. However, the demon queen thought that the young man would trust Renée more than her. She played along and said that she didn't realize the master monster's cunning plan right away. It all makes sense now. Girls have to be on their guard all the time, because you never know when these people will think of attacking you. While the demon queen was saying that she was going to check one of the paths to the main room again, someone managed to enter the dungeon at that time, as evidenced by the magical marks on the floor. It was a special mid-level observation magic. The demon queen heard someone's footsteps and shouted that someone had entered the dungeon. Since only one special magical eye responded, it meant that the intruder was most likely alone. In the next instant, the girls jumped up sharply from their seats and prepared for battle, drawing their weapons. However, someone was walking leisurely in their direction, treading confidently on the stone floor in their golden clogs. And why are these two girls so alarmed? Renée opened her mouth in surprise, but the demon queen did not understand her surprise at all. It was the same vampire from the big castle Renée used to go to get her hair cut. She asked the girl how she was doing, smiling slightly as she watched her reaction to her sudden appearance. The once quiet dungeon overflowed with the sound of bats flapping their wings as they followed their mistress out of the castle. The vampire assured Renée not to worry about the food she hadn't prepared in time for her unexpected visit. To smooth things over a bit, the woman joked that she wouldn't mind tasting Renée's blood if she offered her some food. To which the girl, still clutching her weapon, replied that she certainly couldn't offer such a thing. She didn't seem to get the joke yet. A moment later, all three were sitting at the table, and now the woman was curious to know what kind of beauty was sitting across from her. Then the demon queen rose from the table and with great pomp began to recite her full title, taking into account the seventeenth generation in the lineage. Renée was able to relax a bit and smiled as she explained that she was the one who had forgotten to introduce her guest to the demon queen. The woman looked fondly at the young girl, who, in her opinion, had a very unusual aura. The demon queen was surprised that a very powerful boss of a famous castle had come to visit them. She approached Renée and told her that she would probably see the other main bosses if she stayed with them in this dungeon. Renée laughed at her words and grabbed her friend's cheeks. In her opinion, a demon queen couldn't just declare such things and live with them like a parasite. These words did not go unnoticed by the vampire, who realized that the demon queen was not a regular member of this dungeon. She raised her golden glass in the air, offering to pour something delicious into it. In the next second, the bat that flew up transformed into a servant, eagerly pouring fresh blood for his mistress. As if that wasn't unusual enough for everyone else at the table, the vampirus wanted to know where the owner of this place had gone with his skeleton friend. Our girls informed her that the two had gone off on their own for a while. This news made the woman uneasy, for it takes a very good reason to leave the dungeon. Renée had sensed her inner turmoil and now began to worry about her master again. The vampirus began to run her fingers around the rim of her golden glass, suggesting that the servant had blood and informed them that all the villages near her castle had been completely destroyed. 
They were literally drenched in blood, which meant that people had died. But there were no bodies, they were all gone. That was what had caused her concern and why she had come here. People obviously couldn't do this. The traces of blood on the ground led in a certain direction, as if forming a path. And that path led to the very village where our heroes were. What could it mean? The demon queen suggested that it might be the work of the undead. To which the vampires, taking another sip, replied that it was quite likely. However, few undead are capable of such a thing. After all, most undead are unintelligent. Only superior species with the special title of elder are rational. And since the army of the dead was moving in the same direction, it meant that someone was leading them. It seemed to be the lord of the dead, the immortal king Erebos. In the vampire's opinion, it was him. She ended her thought analysis with this conclusion. The two girls didn't know what to say and froze for a while. The woman wanted to inform the boss of this place as soon as possible and asked for a monster to be sent to him to deliver the message. Unfortunately, according to Renee's words, the dungeon is currently empty and no one is there. Then perhaps the girl has another way to communicate with her master. To which Renee replied that she didn't have that method of communication and that she didn't even question her boss's decisions. To the vampire's delight, there was a skeleton next to our protagonist who was far more intelligent. She was very worried, so it was necessary to get the message across somehow. In the next second, the demon queen announced with great enthusiasm that she, the greatest of them all, would now take matters into her own hands. During this time in the night city, our protagonist continued to communicate with one of the surviving men of the village. It all began with a black catastrophe. Shortly after it hit the village, someone set fire to the fields. The rapidly spreading fire destroyed the ripe harvest, leaving only ashes. At the same time, bad rumors began to spread in the village. People said that all the crops and places where the black disaster had passed were contaminated. And if you touch them, you'll catch a painful disease. So the whole village became a cursed place. The man continued his story while our hero listened attentively. Then a rumor spread that even His Majesty the Emperor had abandoned the village. And that's when the people got really desperate. But even in this despair, there was a small ray of hope. A wealthy couple of commoners decided to take care of the villagers. They had plenty of crops, which fortunately had not been damaged by the fire. So they opened their stores and began distributing food to the residents. A group of people began to form around this couple who decided to work together to survive. However, just as everyone was beginning to believe in the best, something terrible happened. The couple was found murdered in their home. Someone, hungry for more food, killed the couple. After that, the village lost all trust in each other. And without trust, no one would come together. People just locked themselves in their homes, hoping that their food wouldn't be taken from them and they would starve to death. Thanks to rumors that the grain was contaminated, no one touched it. And we alley people managed not to starve. After this long story, our hero asked him his question. So, contrary to all the rumors, you weren't poisoned by the grain? The man replied with a deep breath that not yet, and they were still alive. Our hero thought to himself that the grain could hardly be poisoned, since he had not even touched it. Someone must have deliberately spread the rumor with malicious intent. So our hero and the man went on their way. They walked past the guards and out of the village. They saw a pile of corpses in front of them. The man continued to speak. At first, many thought that we could quickly overcome this disaster. But here is the result of such complacency. He pointed to the pile of dead people who had no one to protect them. If you leave the corpses outside, the insects will decompose them. So we started digging holes and stacking the bodies like this. Our hero asked him why they didn't burn the corpses. The man replied that the problem was also that no one had volunteered to burn the bodies. The smell of death was so strong that he had to cover his nose with a handkerchief to which the man added that he had forgotten to mention the parents of the girl who had robbed them at the hotel that night. As it turned out, the girl's parents were also lying somewhere in that pile of corpses. Our hero was lucid and asked the man about the guards standing at the entrance gate. The guards stand here in two shifts, but they don't guard the place, 
they control it. In this situation, it was clear to our hero that the soldiers were most likely doing so on the orders of their ruler. As expected, the ruler is too suspicious. In such cases, a face-to-face -face meeting is the best way to clear things up. You won't be able to find out his hidden agenda using conventional methods. Meanwhile, the Knight of Bones had climbed into a nest from which he had stolen a harpy's egg. He planned to ambush and kill any birds that would fly in to get the egg. This way he would get an audience with the ruler. What a brilliant idea. I'm a genius. The skeleton thought to himself. But the next moment, quite unexpectedly, a huge flock of those flying birds came screaming at him, demanding the return of the stolen goods. Standing with a candle in her hands, the young girl saw a horrible picture before her eyes. Her brother had decided to hang himself and said goodbye to her by saying that she should live. In any case, she must live. After that, the girl screamed loudly and woke up. She couldn't stop crying and tears streamed from her eyes. Her assistant entered the room and realized that the mistress was having another nightmare. A very tearful girl tried to calm down and said she was fine. She was the current leader of this village. It was too early and she didn't want to sleep anymore and decided to go out on the balcony to get some fresh air. It had only been a few weeks since she had inherited the title of ruler from her brother. She vividly remembered the day he died. Her family had fled with all their possessions, and the village was still struggling to recover. She had only one way to survive in such a situation. She had to bring back the old look of the place. Later that afternoon, a young girl received a stranger in her palace. He promised her salvation and assured her that he could protect her and her land. But it seems that this did not happen, so she screamed and suggested that he look out the window and see the supposed salvation he was talking about. In a low voice, the hooded man replied that he had not broken his promise and that all the villagers' problems would soon be solved. Therefore, the girl should not be so worried. She stared at him in silence for a while, thinking that this man would never reveal the details of his plans, but now she had no choice but to trust him. He reassured her, telling her in his quiet voice that everything was going according to plan, so mistress shouldn't worry and could go on with her comfortable life. Then he paused and said with a slight smile that all her worries would soon be gone. The girl exhaled deeply and said that she was willing to wait a little longer and that she trusted him. Her assistant entered the hall and asked her mistress's permission to report upstairs on the condition and safety of their lands. The girl was curious to know what news had occurred the night before. The assistant replied that the guards had reported an attack by the Harpy family from the north gate, but a knight had suddenly appeared and single-handedly repelled the attack. The girl couldn't believe her words. How could he be alone and why was this knight alone? Whom did he serve? The advisor replied that the castle guards had asked him the same questions, but he remained silent. The young lord of the castle was very interested in meeting him. She wanted to know where he was. Her assistant replied that the knight had been taken to the castle's reception area. We see his silhouette in the doorway. At this point, the hooded man turned to the young girl. He suggested that she reconsider her decision to meet this knight, as he might be an assassin in disguise. However, the girl replied, the fact that he is suspicious does not negate his merit in saving the village. And it is natural for a ruler to pay attention to such deeds. She then gave the order for the knight to be brought to her. After a while, our skeleton appeared in front of her, and he fell on his knees before her and said that he was a wandering knight who had the great honor of greeting the ruler of this village. It was not an easy road for him to get here, and he is very tired but just standing in front of such a noble ruler makes him feel rewarded for his hard work. With a stern voice, the girl told him that he had protected her village with his bravery and courage. On behalf of the entire village, she wanted to express her gratitude. The helmeted knight replied that he was honored. At the same time, he thought that the girl didn't look much like a ruler, and judging by her age, he assumed that she was the younger sister of the former ruler of this village. She was very curious to know what kind of family he served, but there was only silence in response. Our knight was silent and said nothing. Then she tried to find out his name, but even then he replied that unfortunately he could not tell her his name and asked her to understand and forgive him. 
His words made the girl slightly indignant because she realized he had something to hide. But if she asked him to take off his helmet, would he really refuse? Kneeling down and lowering his head, the knight replied in a low voice that his face was disfigured with battle scars and half of his skin had been peeled off, making him look unpleasant. But if the ruler wished, he would obey and remove his helmet. His words were enough to make the girl give up her desire to see his face, and she told him that although she could not offer him much, she wanted to repay him. What does he want? The knight immediately replied that he wished to be fed by holding his right hand to his heart. A sign of great respect for the young lady. The wise skeleton realized that the most valuable thing in the village right now was food, and depending on her answer, he would be able to understand the current state of the castle. Literally at that second, the girl replied that she was ready to provide him with anything he needed. She asked her assistant to bring him some food. The knight thanked her for her generosity. He thought that since she had answered without hesitation, there was plenty of food in the castle. But then it was not at all clear why the lord had allowed the village to fall into such a sorry state. In addition, our knight was very disturbed by this hooded man standing nearby. He could feel some kind of energy from him. He felt a strange closeness from him. Skeleton couldn't hold back any longer and asked the ruler for permission to ask her one more question. The girl nodded, and the knight continued. Something has been bothering him for some time now, or rather someone has been bothering him. Then he turned suspiciously to the hooded man and asked who he was. After a while, the skeleton returned to our protagonist and told him everything that had happened to him in the castle. The young man realized that his friend's question was very impertinent, so perhaps the lord of the castle had reacted somehow. But the knight explained that he had asked his question out of pure curiosity, so she just let him go. Our hero replied that his friend had gotten off very lightly, since he could leave this castle without any trouble. Then why didn't he leave the hooded man alone, since he felt some sort of intimacy with him? The skeleton replied that there was nothing left for him to do, that even if he felt some kind of closeness, a sense of kinship, it didn't mean that this man was undead at all. Necromancers sometimes emit such an aura, and black mages also emit similar energy, but it depends on how much of it they have absorbed. Slightly irritated, our hero replied that there wasn't enough time to test all his theories. If it were him, he'd just kill everyone in there. In a stern voice, the knight replied that they were here to fix all the things his boss had done before, not to cause more problems. Maybe the master wants his knight to quit? The young man apologized. The skeleton now turned to him, hoping to learn some new information from our hero. The boss replied that the locals believe that all crops are contaminated with some kind of plague. He was curious as to why the village was so quiet. It turned out that people were refusing to eat the supposedly poisoned food and were starving to death. At the same time, he tried very hard to get close to the girl who had stolen their belongings earlier, but she kept running away from him and did not trust him. Jokingly, the skeleton said that it would be great if he took a demon queen with him who had mind control magic. However, that doesn't mean that they don't have other ways, so he suggested that our hero take a look at the bag of food that the emperor gave him. The young man was very happy about this news, because he was already very hungry and wanted to eat. However, the skeleton told him that now was not the right time to eat, and that they had to use the food to win the favor of the red-haired girl. Cold sweat ran down the girl's face, and her eyes widened with fear as she saw our hero in front of her. The young man didn't understand why she was so afraid of him, and he held out some food in front of her. He said he had something special to share with her, and offered to take what was inside. The girl looked at him in surprise and calmed down. She did not hide her astonishment and happiness, for it was the very prospera that the bishop had given her. It was an unleavened round bread eaten during rituals of worship. Our hero did not understand at all how this could be, since the same prospera had been given to him earlier by the skeleton. He was curious to know which bishop she was talking about. After a while, our protagonist and the girl were walking somewhere. She happily ran ahead and asked her companion if he really believed in a higher power. She was very happy that she finally had a believer around her for a long time, because no one else believed in higher powers except her. 
she thought everyone else was very stupid. It was so easy to offer them salvation, and all they needed was sincere belief, and people didn't notice. She turned to him, wondering if Sir Knight agreed with her. The young man couldn't find anything to say and mumbled something inaudible. Finally, they reached the place the girl had led them to. She noticed that she always got a little scared when she came here, because they had to go down into this dark, damp cave. They began to cautiously descend the wet and slippery stairs. Their path was lit by the few torches on the walls. It was now clear to our hero that this was an underground temple, and all these people gathered here were parishioners of the bishop who was now preaching. He told them that the calamity that had befallen their village were the trials that had been given to the people for their wickedness. But there is someone who is an almighty being, and he is able to deal with these trials. Therefore, all those who have found faith in him are chosen and honorable men. The girl motioned for our hero to sit down to continue listening to the bishop's words, while everyone else paid no attention to her. The bishop kept repeating to all present that they should always remember the supreme being who gives them all gifts. So today he would share the bread with them. Our hero listened to this mumbling with great boredom, and to him it was just brainwashing. It's no big deal. The girl did not hide her joy and happiness because, in her opinion, they had come just in time, and now the most interesting thing would happen. Our hero got up from his seat and saw how the people began to approach the bishop who was handing out the wafers that a knight had brought from the castle of the village's lord. As if in secret, the girl turned to our hero and whispered that someone would soon save her village and that all who believed in this creature would find eternal happiness. Our hero asked her what eternal happiness she was referring to. The girl replied that she didn't know exactly, but they would probably get a more noble gift from the bishop. What else is this gift? Our young man inquired. The girl again replied that she didn't know, but probably something better than just a prospera, maybe even meat. At this point, the bishop approached them. He greeted the girl and gave her a small wafer. She thanked him. All the while, our hero sat on a bench and watched from the sidelines. Then the bishop approached him, causing our hero to rise from his seat. He said that this was the first time he had met this young man, and he really hoped that he would continue to come here. The bishop then extended his hand and held out a large prospera for our hero. However, in the next second, our hero noticed something very strange. The bishop's hand was emitting magical mana, which he was using on ordinary people. At this point, our hero became very angry and realized that an unusual person was standing in front of him. The prospera shattered into small pieces and fell to the ground. Our hero grabbed the man's shoulder and got as close to him as possible. Was he really trying to study him? He realized that it was manna, invisible to humans, but not to him. Our hero calmly told him that he didn't care what this man did to people, but he had no right to stick his nose into his body. At this point, the man told him that he was not human. He added that although he didn't have a very good memory, he would remember this young man. The girl looked at them both and had absolutely no idea what was going on. She turned to our hero, Sir Knight, and asked him to explain. The young man replied that nothing much had happened. He sincerely thanked the bishop for the food and suggested that he leave sooner. After a while, they said goodbye to each other and went their separate ways. Our hero realized that after all he'd seen, he didn't need any more proof. Some bishop shows up in a remote village with his pseudo-religion, brainwashing people and monitoring them with unknown manna. Then there's the strange hooded man next to the ruler who reeks of undead aura. Even he has no trouble noticing that everything seems very organized. Which means that someone is behind all these people, controlling their actions. The demon queen was pleased to hear our hero's story and did not hide her admiration at the sight of the dungeon lord. But he looked at her again with his usual look of disgust. He definitely didn't like her emotions. The demon queen replied that she was very interested in seeing the mess he had made here for herself. So she climbed higher to survey her surroundings. The young man was well aware that she had not come here out of curiosity, and he tried to learn from her the true purpose of her visit. Circling around our hero on her large wings, the demon queen replied that she had come on behalf of the vampire who had stopped at his dungeon. 
she asked me to tell you that the undead were moving into the village. Our hero was very surprised that a vampiress was visiting him in his dungeon. The demon queen added that she had asked to be told about the strange footprints discovered earlier near her castle that led to this village. It seems that our protagonist now understood who was behind it all. The demon queen paused for a moment and added in a low voice that, in the vampire's opinion, Erebos was behind it all. This information didn't seem to surprise our hero at all, who said that the Erebos version fits, but it's just a guess. However, the demon queen was also thinking about it. And in her opinion, when the undead attack a village, it is typical for them to be outnumbered. Therefore, it was highly unlikely that the village would be able to stand up to anyone in the situation it was in. After that, she activated her magic power and thrust her weapon into the roof of the building with tremendous force. She was very curious to know if her suspicions were correct and why those she spoke of had not invaded this village in a similar manner. It was a special magic to detect the flow of mana that could be used by the enemies. And in the next second, the demon queen realized that her guess was correct and that she had hit the nail on the head by detecting the mana flow. A large flock of red-eyed crows cawed loudly as they flew over the pile of dead villagers. At that time, someone approached the pile of corpses, completely unafraid of the suffocating stench. And that someone was the same man our skeleton had seen earlier in the village leader's castle. The man took off his hood. He fell to his knees, touched the ground with his hands, and began to recite magic spells. Now we know who this man was. In fact, he was the gatekeeper of one of the largest dungeons, a very powerful magician. As if obeying his magic spells, a huge flock of crows began to form into a large pile in the sky. Out of nowhere, High in the sky, someone's ominous voice could be heard, cheerfully greeting his faithful servant. The man fell to his knees even lower and held out his hands to greet Lord Erebos, his master. He was here to give his master the very last report before he entered the village. The sinister voice replied that it would never forget his hard work and would be sure to thank him later. A huge black cloud descended to hear the report he had prepared for him. The man informed him that unexpected forces had interfered with his work. The black cloud replied that it had received the same report earlier from another of its servants. Perhaps the persona he's talking about also carries a weapon that emits an undead aura. The man replied that the creature did not carry any weapons, and he could not sense any such aura from it. However, he could feel an enormous amount of black energy emanating from it. Black cloud thought for a moment. Actually, it sounds very interesting. However, it seems like these two were not worried about anyone else interfering with their devious plan. Black Cloud said with a menacing voice that it doesn't matter who interferes with them, but they shouldn't forget that their main goal is to defeat this village before they can conquer the entire empire. Therefore, it is imperative for this man to complete the plan they have agreed upon. However, one of his servants has already sent reinforcements to the castle's casemates. Perhaps this man also needs assistance. However, he assured his master that there was no need for help, and if such a need arose, he would be sure to inform his master. The black cloud retreated higher and higher into the sky, declaring that in that case, she would leave him alone with this plan and expect everything to be carried out. After his words, the blue-eyed crows began to disperse, and the black cloud gradually disappeared. There was not much time left before this creature would enter the village, so the man should execute the whole plan quickly, because soon no one would be able to stop it. Meanwhile, on the roof of one of the tallest buildings, our heroes continued to analyze the current situation. Our hero asked the demon queen if she could find out who used these spells. It was important for him to know where he was now. The demon queen replied that it would be quite difficult for her to do so, but those kinds of spells with such great power usually use the flow of mana on the surface to sustain themselves. Obviously, someone who used these spells must be nearby, very nearby. However, that was just their guess, for that level of magic to cover the entire village, and for whoever could use it to do so, they would need special peculiar stones that could maintain their power all the time. And most likely, such stones with enormous mana inside were hidden somewhere beneath the surface not far away. The demon queen then pointed her wand in the direction of the castle, 
where she thought the source of power might be. In his usual manner, our hero began to yawn at her words. Although he himself was not sure about her words, if the demon queen was right, then he might be able to destroy everything around that place, and then the source of power would end. And since the demon queen wasn't busy at the moment, unlike the skeleton knight, he offered to go to this castle with him. After hearing his words and such a suggestion, his friend with the big wings behind her back was even a little scared. But it seems that our hero was very determined and ready to show his strength. He had a cunning plan. Meanwhile, the skeleton knight had arrived at the castle of the village lord. He was very curious to know what it was about this place that emitted such a strong stench of death. The last time he was here, the stench wasn't that strong, but now it was much stronger. Therefore, he was very worried and wanted to investigate this place in detail. It was probably an underground prison, but considering the situation, that didn't make any sense. He slowly made his way down. The deeper he went, the louder the sound of a metal object hitting him. A moment later, he saw an interesting image in front of his eyes. The fearsome creature was hitting the human flesh on the table with great force with its huge butcher knife. This, it turned out, was the cause of the pungent smell. Our hero was not surprised. Like a knight, our hero turned to this huge monster and asked who its master was. However, in the next second, the creature's eyes filled with rage, and with great force, it tried to strike at the knight. But the butcher was very surprised by what had just happened, because his blow was easily stopped by the skeleton, who said that even though he was very strong, he would not succeed. The monster tried to strike again, but with both hands. Continuing to taunt him, the skeleton said that this blow was worthy of his strength, but at the sight of all this, our hero realized that he had no need to hide his strength, and that the man from above in the hood was one with this monster. And now that he's sure he's right, he can easily destroy this creature. He said that this monster could now disappear, and with a slight movement of his hand, he destroyed it, breaking it in half. However, as soon as he did so, someone attacked him from behind. The impact was so strong that his helmet was thrown aside. His helmet clattered on the stone floor, and the skeleton said that it took him by surprise. Who could it be? Our skeleton warrior saw another magical knight in front of him who was very strong and had incredible power. What could this creature be doing in this place, and what was it planning to do? Now our knight had to deal with another monster who also had the appearance of a knight. With his stern, bony voice, he turned to him to find out on whose orders he was guarding the place. But this monster didn't seem to be in the mood for conversation at all, and in the next second, a fierce battle broke out between the two knights. Our warrior was the first to deliver his mighty crushing blow, which shattered the monster into pieces. However, the magical knight recovered and used his weapon to attack the skeleton. Our warrior noticed that his opponent had a special sword, a sword of evil. He used it in his attacks. The damage from this sword was very strong because it confused his opponent's weapon. Unfortunately, our skeleton had already received some wounds in this battle, and he realized that his opponent was very strong. But in the next second, he struck again with an even stronger blow, shattering the monster into large pieces. Maybe they could talk again. No sooner had he said that, than he had to dodge the blow of that huge sword once again in order to stay alive as much as possible for a skeleton. Now he was finally convinced that no one would talk to him. But somehow he still had to find out the reason for this knight's presence in the castle. In the next second, our skeleton looked at his opponent with a sardonic look and came up with a cunning plan to defeat him. He seemed to realize that the owner of this monster would be able to answer all these questions. In the next second, he activated a special magic that flew towards his enemy with a powerful blow. Then, the skeleton warrior managed to grab huge stone axes and smash the creature to pieces. The impact was so powerful that his enemy was thrown high into the air, hit the ceiling, and fell back to the ground. Our warrior told him that since his opponent didn't want to talk to him, he would be finished with him rather quickly, so there was no point in resisting. He then drew his sword and prepared to strike again. Of course, with his special sword, which he wielded perfectly, 
he was able to deliver such crushing blows that there was no trace left of that monster, and it was completely destroyed. At that time, the young ruler had just woken up in one of the rooms of the castle and noticed that her room was rather cool. As soon as she opened her eyes, she heard a familiar voice. He asked the young girl how well she had slept. It came as a complete surprise to her, as she had not expected to see the knight she had recently spoken to. Our skeleton warrior was standing right in front of her, and the girl tried to cover herself with a blanket. Then she started yelling at him, asking him what the hell he was doing here in the middle of the night, and how he got in. In a very calm voice, the skeleton warrior replied that he came here for a reason. Most likely, there is some common cause between them that needs to be resolved. He held his huge sword in his right hand and showed it to the girl. The metal gleamed in the light of the lamps, reflecting the purity and perfection of the weapon. She looked at him fearfully, trying to figure out what was going on. Then he pointed the tip of the weapon in her direction and told her that she had exactly five minutes to answer all of his questions. He ordered her to summon the same hooded man who had been with her in the reception area earlier that afternoon. After a while, the young girl sat on the couch, wrapped in her blanket. The hooded man stood beside her. Our knight apologized again, as any gallant gentleman would, and said that he was very sorry to wake her so late, but that he had been forced to do so by very serious circumstances. And after he had said that, he threw something very interesting on the table which made the girl very frightened. She asked him what it was. He replied with surprise that she didn't know what it could be. Our skeleton knight leaned slightly in her direction and said in a very stern voice that this was the helmet of a defeated enemy, the same magical knight who had been defeated by our hero in the prison under the castle. As he approached the girl, he asked her in an even more stern voice why she continued to work with the undead, how she cooperated with them. At this point, a hooded man entered the conversation and said he had absolutely no idea what the knight was talking about. But our warrior was not shy and said that he was very upset by their words and behavior, if they were going to continue to play like this, pretending that nothing happened. Our knight looked at the hooded man carefully, very sternly, and told him that if he wasn't playing with him, why wasn't he aware of who he was really working with and who was directing his actions? Especially considering his status— he should realize what kind of things have been going on in his country for quite some time. However, the hooded man was in no mood to talk to our knight and turned to the girl, advising her to immediately stop any conversation with this knight and call the guards so they could catch him. Before he could finish, the knight interrupted him and said that he had killed the magic monster right in the room that was under the floor of this great hall. The girl asked him again if he had really done it in the prison below. However, in the next second, the hooded man was up to something very bad and slowly began to draw his weapon. At that time, our knight replied to the girl that there were indeed a large number of corpses in that prison, so he could not give her any more clues. Then he turned his sword to the hooded man and said that he was actually already dead and was a powerful magician. The girl protested, saying that she couldn't just believe what he said, did he really think she could take it on faith just because he said it. She began to defend the man, telling the knight in a loud voice that he had promised to protect her village and do everything to restore it to its former glory. She then attacked our knight with a fierce voice, shouting loudly, telling him that he was only accusing this man on an empty basis, calling him undead in the face of the danger that threatened this village. Our knight did not fail to notice that she had gone crazy and gave him many additional things. Is she really trying to tell him that she really knows who exactly is threatening this village and trying to destroy everyone here? A look of horror crossed the girl's face and a cold sweat ran down her back. At this point, the hooded man re-entered the conversation and said that the two of them should calm down a bit before making any decisions. He turned to the knight and told him that this helmet was not so easy to get, because such a powerful warrior could not be found anywhere. Our knight started to play with them and said that he was also very surprised to find such a powerful opponent in this prison, in this castle. How could he not agree with this conclusion? Then he added that he was a bit surprised by the behavior of this magic knight, who, according to his status, should have a higher level of intelligence, and his movements seemed very strange, as if someone was controlling him from outside. 
Nevertheless, he managed to find out more information about his opponent. However, he was able to study his inner workings, his magical soul. It was only when he destroyed him that he discovered that underneath this knight's armor were special magic spells that allowed someone to control his mind from a distance. The armor also had the name of the wearer engraved on it, and he was able to read it. It was the name of a famous vice-captain of a special unit that had gone on a raid to destroy the undead thirty years ago. According to all known data, this knight was very strong, but something went wrong, and after that raid, no one heard from him again he disappeared somewhere. Our knight decided to play a little joke on them and said that now it was time for questions and a special quiz. Who did they think was the powerful rival that this vice-captain wanted to destroy? The girls started to mumble something inaudible, but then our skeleton warrior raised his sword and said that this time he would ask his question a little differently. He brought his sword very close to the hooded man who had been standing motionless all this time, and told him that he would be very grateful if he could personally answer all his questions. Our skeleton knight brought his sword right up to the neck of this man, who had been standing there all this time without showing any signs of excitement. Then he asked his only question in his ominous voice. Where did he think the person responsible for all this could be? Mr. Eribos. An awkward pause filled the air, and everyone was at a loss as to what to do next. The girl was motionless, sitting in one spot on her couch in fear. The knight held his sharp sword right in front of the man's neck, who stood there calmly looking at our skeleton. The young girl didn't understand what Mr. Eribos had to do with anything. After all, she knew that he was one of the top bosses of the great dungeons of evil. At this time, the hooded man stopped restraining himself and started laughing a devilish laugh. His voice grew louder and louder and the girl looked in his direction in horror. She then began to scream at him, saying that he had promised her to protect the entire village and herself in particular. The man replied with a sneering grin that his plans hadn't changed, but his eyes began to glow red at that point. His tone changed, and he told everyone present that there may have been a change in plans, but it would have no effect on the main action he had in mind. A peaceful solution to this situation was simply not possible at this time. The girl looked at him with wide open eyes in horror, trying to understand what he meant. In the next second, the man tried to do something with his right hand with a quick movement, but our knight did not give him such an opportunity, and immediately cut off his hand. Then he ordered them all to stand still and not to make any unnecessary movements. The hooded man stood perfectly still, as if he was unharmed. In that second, the girl realized everything and backed away, seeing the undead in front of her. In the next instant, the man began to transform into what he really was. The young ruler of the village was horrified to see a huge monster in front of her, who said that he would kill everyone in the village and turn it into a huge pile of corpses. He looked down at the girl and told her that she should be grateful to him because she still had a chance to save herself, but now there was none. Finally. When all the masks had fallen, the creature confessed that all that had happened before was a step in Mr. Eribo's grand plan. His words surprised our knight, who had not expected things to turn out this way. In his opinion, the undead were a race that could only fight by the quantity of their warriors, not by their quality. The knight had never thought that they would be capable of such a cunning invasion, carefully organized and planned. The creature emitting a red aura looked at the knight, and said that he was very interested in him when he first met him. He also wanted to praise him for exceeding his expectations by being able to defeat this magical knight. Our skeleton jokingly replied that he was very happy to hear such warm words. Someone first praised him for killing some undead. The creature in the red cloak, who had extra eyes to better see the space around him, said he was very surprised by his behavior and seemed to be just like himself, not alive. Then why does he not serve his master Eribos? The next second, the girl was even more puzzled. She seemed to have figured out that the person in front of her was not a knight of the imperial court, but also a person who was not a living being. Our skeleton was worried that he had been recognized, and now his plan had failed. He began to beat himself a little with the sword on his helmet, unsure of what to do next. He couldn't kill this girl because he needed the people to continue cooperating with them for the great plan. 
His mood had changed drastically and now he didn't know what to do. However, this pause was used by the red-hooded creature who planned to do something in the next second. But as soon as he reached out his hand, our knight cut it off again, and it fell to the ground. He again ordered the creature to stay still and do as he said. Our knight's words, however, elicited a great laugh from his opponent, who said that there was no way his intimidation could work on an already dead creature. Our hero replied that he might be right, his intimidation might not work on him, but he still had something to lose, especially since he had already chopped off two of his arms. He looked at his enemy and said that if he really had time to study him by now, he should realize that the creature that came with him, which was our protagonist, was much more powerful than he imagined. And the power of this creature is so great that it can easily destroy all his plans. Standing still, the dead man in the red cloak said with a grin that this was a very interesting message, meaning that it was likely that the power of this creature affected humans as well. Our knight told him that unfortunately they were not on the side of the humans, so it was not worth wasting his time, and it was better to explain things as they were. Also, our hero said, this enemy should explain to him what Mr. Erebos was really up to. The fearsome creature opposite our knight agreed to answer all his questions in detail. He then asked our skeleton if he knew how to obtain these special creatures that come from the undead. The knight began to lose patience again, because he wanted answers, not more questions. However, the terrifying creature went on to say that it was incredible for an ordinary human or elf to become such a special creature. This transformation requires an enormous amount of hate to begin the magical transformation. The reason these creatures were called that was because each one of them could fight thousands of zombies by itself. But Mr. Erebos was special in this regard, for it was only through his magic that he was able to create these special creatures in such large numbers. It was only now that our knight realized the ultimate plan that this and other monsters had devised. The fearsome creature said that the knight was thinking in the right direction because they needed humans. Although they had weak souls, their bodies could be used to transform into these special beings. This village was the perfect place to make as many of these creatures as possible because they could use humans to completely isolate them, gradually weakening their bodies so that they couldn't fight back. His words made the girl tremble with fear. Among other things, they created a special religion to control people's minds and gradually weaken them. Our knight seems to have understood his words, but what was the need for the mountain of corpses he found in the underground prison? The answer was simple. The creature replied that it was necessary to create more special soldiers. In response, the terrifying creature announced in an ominous voice that it would destroy the entire empire. Loud laughter echoed through the room. This was very bad news for our knight. If the entire empire is destroyed and all the people who lived in it are turned into dead people by these special soldiers, then the next target of this evil team will be the people who live in the great dungeons of evil. So this whole plan threatened our heroes as well. The terrifying creature laughingly declared that it was better late than never to realize something, and in the next second, strong magic began to appear around our knight. The flow of black magic was so strong that our hero had to defend himself with his sword, and the young girl almost died. In the next second, a huge number of arms surrounded our knight from all sides, preventing him from moving. In an ominous voice, his opponent said, Did he really think that since he was able to take away his arms, there was nothing he could do now? How stupid was he to think like that? However, these words made our warrior laugh. And does this knight really think he told him the whole truth? In this creature's mind, there is no one who can stand up to him and disrupt all of his plans. Shackled by black magic, the skeleton stood there, unable to move. His weapon was also immobilized. According to this terrifying creature, who had begun to gain even more power thanks to his magic, there was only one creature that would be able to stop them. It was the ancient monster that lived deep underground. He meant our protagonist. So there's no stopping them now. After that, huge black mana streams and a lance-shaped glowing orb flew towards the knight. However, this did not worry our hero, who said he wanted to ask him another question, whereupon he easily began to free himself from the magical arms restraining his movements. This caused great confusion to the evil wizard, 
who realized that his black magic was completely powerless. The knight shattered all those magical hands with ease, and now he slowly removed his helmet, revealing his true nature. His eyes glowed with a bright blue light. He looked directly at the creepy monster and told him that maybe he was right. If things were really as he had planned, and the only power that could stop them was this ancient monster, then he would be able to demonstrate its power to him right now. In the next second, a large number of black tentacles flew towards that monster, completely thwarting its plans. The energy release was so powerful that it completely destroyed the room down to the ground, scattering rocks in all directions. The knight breathed a sigh of relief and said that the boss had appeared just in time. Our protagonist sat confidently and calmly on a huge pile of construction debris, the materials that had been used to build this castle. The young girl was incredibly lucky to have survived this terrible chaos. When the dust cleared a bit and she was able to cough, an incredible scene unfolded before her eyes. A certain young man in a black cloak was sitting high on the ruins of this room, and another woman with some horns was complaining that she had fallen and hurt her head. The knight was very happy to see his boss again, for he had arrived just in time. The skeleton thanked him for his help. And while our heroes exchanged the information they had learned, the girl sat on the stone floor and watched them silently. This young man didn't seem at all bothered by what was going on. Maybe he even whistled some kind of song. However, in the next second, a huge black magic arrow flew towards our hero. Fortunately, it missed him and shattered on the sleeve of his clothes. All of our heroes immediately turned in the direction from which the shot had just been fired and noticed someone rising from a huge pile of garbage. Our hero realized who it was, and in the next second, with a slight movement, he once again directed his power at the monster, who could not die in any way because he was already dead. This terrifying creature looked at our hero and could not believe its eyes, of which it had four, because it did not expect to see him here at all. The knight laughed again and reminded him of his words that his companion was much stronger than he could imagine. Our hero looked at the creature and didn't understand what it was. At the same time, the red-skinned monster had also been watching our hero the whole time, not understanding how this ancient beast could be right in front of him. Now, he could no longer use his black magic because the crystal that gave him power had been destroyed. Still permeated by the black tentacles of our hero, he scrutinized the girl standing next to our knight. From the energy emanating from her, he realized that she was a demon queen. He was so surprised that he loudly proclaimed that he had to pass this information on to his lord, Erebos. Then he turned to our hero and asked him why this ancient monster was here. After all, as far as he knew, after the incident in the city, this monster hid deep underground in its dungeon and never showed itself on the surface again. However, in the next second, the demon queen's very powerful punch struck this monster, and with tremendous force, it flew out of the window and fell to the ground. He started coughing and his strength was dwindling, but he said that they were wasting their time because nothing could be done. The demon queen attacked him again with her magic and told him he was talking too much. In his usual manner, our hero continued to yawn. Even he seemed to be getting tired of the fact that there was no way they could destroy him. Whatever they did, it continued to exist. He commanded the demon queen to finish it, and in the next second, an incredible flow of energy tore the monster to pieces. In the last seconds of his life, he managed to say that his master would come to this land and put an end to them all. Our hero grinned in surprise, and the skeleton knight turned to his friend. The bone warrior joked that this guy made too much of himself, which is why he ended up so badly. Meanwhile, somewhere nearby, three men were still playing dice and discussing the latest news. Doesn't one of them think the sky looks strange today? They looked up and saw strange-sized patches of clouds in the sky. They were black plumes moving across the sky in an unbelievable way. At that time, someone was walking barefoot on the ground. It was a familiar girl with red hair. The next second, someone called her name and asked her what she was doing in such a hurry. The young girl saw the deputy gang leader in front of her and asked him why he was awake at such a late hour. The man replied that he wished he knew the same thing about her. He wanted to know where she had been all this time. 
The girl lied to him that she had just decided to go for a walk to clear her head of bad thoughts. But unfortunately for her, she made a mistake and named the place where no one could ever be in that situation because everyone assumed the area was contaminated. It seemed that now the man would be angry with her again. She turned to him and apologized for her actions, shaking and trembling in her hands. But to her surprise, the man stood and looked at her silently, smiling slightly. Why isn't he angry? The man informed her that the captain and the rest of his crew had made the decision at a recent meeting. They will all leave this village tomorrow. And whatever the girl thought about her new friends, the man assured her that the captain did not like them at all. He then suggested that she follow him, and he could explain everything to her on the way. After a while, the man and the little girl, holding his torch and lighting the way, approached a huge pile of corpses. The stench was so strong that he had to cover his nose with his handkerchief again. He thought that somewhere in that pile were the parents of that poor girl. He told her that once they left, they could never come back to this place. But he left it up to her to do what she wanted. The girl replied that she really didn't understand why the captain of her gang had made such a decision to leave this village. Wasn't this settlement meant to be saved? Maybe we should wait a little longer, and then help will surely come. The man turned to the girl and told her in a stern voice that he wasn't going to convince her of the right thing to do. But did she really think it was okay to stay in this place, waiting for some mythical help, knowing that her parents were buried somewhere deep in that pile of corpses? The girl's eyes began to fill with tears. The man added that even if she believed in higher beings, it didn't mean that she couldn't do anything now. Her fate depended on her actions. She seemed to realize that not only her fate, but the fate of everyone in the village depended on her actions. She turned to her friend and said that he was right. The man looked at her carefully and silently held his torch in front of him. The gentleman then added that she was capable of doing what was needed now. The girl took the large torch in her hands and replied just as briefly that yes, she was ready to do whatever was needed right now. For a few more seconds she stared silently at the huge pile of corpses, holding the torch in her hands. But just as she started to lower her torch to set the place on fire for good, someone stopped her with his hand. Someone's voice wondered what she could be doing in such an unsightly place so late at night. Our heroes were very surprised and the man asked the stranger who he was and why he himself had come to this place tonight. It was the same bishop the girl had seen in the church before. He addressed them by name, and his eyes glowed with a magical red fire. The girl was extremely surprised to see a familiar priest in such a place at such a late hour. He squeezed her hand tightly, and it was clear that he wasn't going to let her do what she intended. The next second, the clothes on his body began to burn, and the girl excitedly told him about it. By now, the man also realized that something strange was going on here. Whether he was a priest or not, he should get behind this girl immediately. The next moment, the man smelled a familiar odor that came from the priest. This meant that this person was not a living person. The girl continued to appeal to the priest in vain, asking him to put out the fire first. She didn't seem to care that he wanted to take her torch. But the priest lost all patience and threw the girl aside with a strong blow. Together with the man, they fell to the ground and she lost consciousness. With an angry look, the man looked in his direction and cursed him. In the next instant, all of the priest's clothes burned completely, revealing his true nature. The man on the ground realized that the person in front of him was not a priest, but a powerful undead sorcerer. Such an image could not fail to arouse the horror of our heroes. The girl came to her senses and could not believe that the priest before her was no longer a priest. The creature ordered her to be silent, as no one should speak in its presence. However, in the next second, an even greater horror seized our heroes at the sight of the incredible image. The former corpses that lay in this mountain began to awaken, turning into zombies. Their eyes slowly opened and filled with an evil red glow. Out of sheer terror, a cold sweat covered the entire body of the girl who could not believe her eyes. The wizard's magic continued to work, and more and more people began to turn into zombies. These frightening creatures began to make horrible noises frightening our heroes even more. They had to get out of here as soon as possible, 
and the man grabbed the girl to leave the place. Their dash forward came just in time, as a large number of these zombies were trying to grab our heroes. In a moment, they were in relative safety. After hiding in a room, they were able to lock the door and move all the furniture so that no one could get in. The man realized that their situation was very bad, and all their actions would only delay the terrible end a little longer. The girl, exhausted, fell to the floor, for she was badly wounded. Turning to her, the man said they had no choice but to go up to the second floor to escape. The girl couldn't walk because her legs were injured, so the man suggested that she climb on his back. Although he was very tired, he was able to take her up to the second floor of that building. Looking out of the window, they were horrified to see huge streams of these zombies coming their way. It was unclear to the man whether they could survive in such a situation. The smell in this room also reminded him of dead people, and that didn't bode well. Standing on the second floor, they could look out the open door and see a large number of zombies. The girl didn't know if they were safe, but it seemed the man wasn't sure either, so he couldn't reassure her. He advised her to concentrate as much as possible if she wanted to survive. The girl didn't seem to understand what that meant. Besides them, there were corpses of people in the room, desperately trying to fight, but failing. A man pointed to a weapon in the hands of one of the dead. The girl pressed herself as close to the wall as she could, not realizing what the man was about to do. He removed the handkerchief from his neck and picked up the sharp knife. And in the next second, turning in her direction, he made a very quick and strong thrust with his weapon. To the girl's surprise, she survived. The man cut off the amulet around the girl's neck, because this thing was bothering him all the time. From now on, the girl would have to believe something more true. Why hadn't she told him before that she was wearing that thing? Now he could understand how the zombies had found out their location. They heard a large number of zombies on the first floor breaking down the door and entering the building. What are they going to do now? The girl realized that she had to defend herself, but she had no weapon in her hands. In the next second, the man began to move away from her. It was clear to her that he was going to fight zombies. It seemed to be the last time he could look at her with a slight smile that meant goodbye. Wide-eyed, the girl stared at him, speechless. Gathering all her strength, she managed to get to her feet and wanted to follow him. But she didn't have time, because the man had already closed the door from the outside and was standing on the other side of the room. He tied his bloody handkerchief around the front door, realizing that it would protect her from the zombies. The smell should distract them. The girl continued to scream in his direction in terror, calling for help. She was very frightened and begged him not to leave her alone but the man didn't seem to hear her. The footsteps of the zombies on the stairs grew louder, and the creatures gradually made their way up to the second floor. The man prepared to fight them. He said goodbye to the girl, telling her to stay calm and not to make any unnecessary movements, lest she be discovered. The man smiled again and praised her for listening to him. For behind his back, all sound ceased. To himself, he thought, this would be better than dying alone. A huge number of zombies came as close as possible to him, but he was not afraid at all and stood firmly on his feet. These terrifying creatures were full of rage and were about to attack him. In the next second, he prepared to strike, and at the last moment, he shouted loudly that he was very sorry for always criticizing the girl. At that time, the little girl was sitting behind the closed doors and realized what was going to happen, but she couldn't make any noise. She held back as much as she could, but huge streams of tears flowed from her eyes.